Good evening to all. My name is Paula Alexson, and I am McCarter Theater Center's Artistic Engagement Manager. On behalf of McCarter, the Bayard Rustin Center for Social Justice, and the New Jersey Theater Alliance, it is my pleasure and a great honor to welcome you to this virtual community play reading of Emily Mann's Execution of Justice. Uh, this event has been more than a year in the making, the result of a brainstorming session for engagement events for the 2019-2020 season, Emily Mann's final season as artistic director and resident playwright. We were imagining ways we might both celebrate her 30 year artistic legacy and further engage in a truly meaningful way with our community partner, the Bayard Rustin Center for Social Justice. A community reading of Emily's groundbreaking documentary drama, Execution of Justice, an examination of the assassination of social justice and LGBTQ icon Harvey Milk and San Francisco Mayor George Moscone and the resulting miscarriage of justice seemed to be the perfect project. And this day, May 22nd, which marks the 90th anniversary of Harvey Milk, seemed the perfect occasion. And we we weren't going to let any pandemic keep us from this celebratory and commemoratory event. So McCarter Play Readings, for those of you new to the concept, are an interactive opportunities to explore the work of a particular playwright, genre, theme, or issue by, uh, by reading a dramatic text communally. Everyone who attends gets a copy of the script, and in ideal circumstances, everyone participates as a reader in some way, though Zoom is a little less ideal for crowd scenes and choral speaking. For this type of reading, no acting experience is presumed or required, nor is previous familiarity with the play text or the medium of theater itself uh, necessary. The overall goals are to offer a new way for all people to engage with theater, to deepen and broaden uh, participation in art making, to create community and camaraderie and new friendships, and to mean if meaningfully stimulate minds and hearts and spirits of those gathered around the campfire with stories that examine the human condition in its most triumphant moments, as well as its most tragic. And now it is a great privilege to introduce McCarter Artistic Director and resident playwright, Emily Mann. Emily, thank you so much. We have to unmute you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Paula, and good evening to everyone. This is an amazingly moving experience for me to share with you on Harvey Milk's 90th birthday. He was one of the great human beings and one of the great activists of the 20th century, and it is wonderful to celebrate him with you all and also um, I don't want to sound presumptuous, but I think perhaps he would be very happy that we are doing this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I started to write this play um, in 1983. Oscar Eustace was the dramaturg. Tony Tacconi uh, was the artistic director of the Eureka Theater. They commissioned me for this in the city of San Francisco. And I decided I would do this only if it could be for their community. And I looked for what the story was and one day I took a cab ride between the theater where they were doing my play Still Life and back to home base where I was staying and I asked the cab driver what is the most important memory you have of recent history in um, in your community and he said I remember just like most people remember where they were when Martin Luther King was killed or when John F Kennedy or Robert Kennedy were killed I was driving my cab when on the radio it came that Supervisor Harvey Milk and George Moscone had been shot and killed he said it shattered his world it happened again when he was driving and the verdict came down and the people rioted and his cab his taxi was set on fire so i thought oh this is an unhealed wound in this city and crazy playwright that i am i'm drawn to unhealed wounds and so that's how execution of justice began 
Thank you for reading tonight. I look forward to being part of the talking circle afterwards. Thank you so much, Emily. I got a little, a little teary eyed introducing you. I, I saw love you that, so much Paula. and I'm glad to be with you for this. Thank you. Oh, you are so wonderful. And, thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the chief activist of the Bayard Rustin Center for Social Justice, Robert Seda Schreiber. Hi, Rob. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Emily. Uh, it's an honor to share the virtual stage with you. Um, it really, really is. And the story you told about the play is so the epitome of what we're doing here and what our center tries to do each and every day, and especially during these extraordinary times. We are so incredibly honored and thrilled to be with you tonight. It is a huge, huge piece for us to be with McCarter Theater every night that we get to be in your center when there was the opportunity for doing so physically was always tremendous for us. And doing this tonight is really just um, the end all be all. For, forgive me, I'll take Thank a page from Paula's book and I'll get a little teary eyed too. <laughs> um, but I know that my time is limited, so let me please quickly tell you a little bit about the center because we're really proud of the work we do. We are a community activist center, an educational enclave, and a safe space for all our LGBTQIA kids, our intersectional families, and all our marginalized people. We want to connect our disparate communities, both locally and nationally. Um, and we've done that um, now during our um, time of cholera. Um, we started after we realized that we couldn't keep the center open, that keeping our beanbags six feet apart was not enough to keep our folks safe enough. We had to close our doors physically. But that very night, 11 weeks ago, we opened them virtually and we created what we call the BRCSJ Social Justice Power Hour. And what that is, is from 7 to 8 p.m. every weeknight for the past 11 weeks, we've been putting on a show. Like we have a barn and we're putting on a show. And it's a virtual bit of community building, a remote fellowship. We have gathered together thousands of viewers each night and been inspired by guests both locally and nationally who have done incredible work. And I cannot tell you how it mean, how much it means to us as a community to share this time with all y'all tonight. And I wanna invite you henceforth to join us um, every weeknight that you want to from 7 to 8, 8, 7 to 8 p.m. live streaming on our Facebook page, facebook.com, Rustin Center. Um, coming up, we just confirmed this today, April Rain, who um, among many other accomplishments, but came up with the hashtag Oscar so white and changed an entire industry. She'll be with us on Monday night and uh, we're gonna do tremendous things for pride, but I'll give you, um, uh, that's a tease because when I come back at the end of the show, I'll share more about our plans for virtual pride. Thank you so much for this evening. Thank you so much for all you do. Thanks for all our readers. My gosh, what a beautiful, it, I, I hope that everybody can see the readers because it's a perfect um, spectrum of what we try to accomplish. The faces I see between gender, identity, sexuality, and age, and beauty. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing and thank you all for tonight. And it's gonna be extraordinarily special. We love you all. Thank you so much, Rob. It's so wonderful to be in partnership with you. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce you to McCarter Artistic Engagement Apprentice, Ellen Valencia, who will speak on behalf of our sponsoring partners for tonight's event. Oh, you're on mute, Ellen. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Rob and Emily. I just want to share a little bit of information about tonight's event. This event is sponsored in part by Stages Online, a partnership with New Jersey Theater Alliance to bring theater content into homes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Stages Online is made possible by the generous funding from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, a partnership agency of the National Endowment for the Arts, Bank of America, the Horizon Foundation for New Jersey, Ocean First Foundation, the George A. Ohl Jr. Trust, New Jersey Historical Commission and the Fund for the New Jersey Blind. So we want to say thank you to all of our folks who are supporting us tonight. I Thanks also so much. 
Oops. Thanks so much, Ellen. Oh Don't go away. I'm not going to go away. I, I want to share a few items just so we know a little bit about our Zoom best practices for today's event. Please be sure to mute yourself when you are not cast in the scene. If you're unsure how to do that, just scroll to the bottom left-hand side of your screen and you're gonna see the options for mute. If you are on the telephone joining us tonight, you can press star six to mute yourself. You can and, also- And to unmute yourself. And to unmute yourself. Thank you, Paula. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I will be on the chat function throughout the night. If you have any specific questions that you need a little bit of support with, please feel free to chat me. Uh, if you go all the way to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat function there. Um, we also, you can utilize the speaker's view or gallery view, depending on your preference. You might also want to hide the videos of those who are not uh, featured with their video function. If you'd like to do that, you can go to stop video on the left-hand side of your screen. You're gonna go to video settings and you'll see the option for hide non-video participants. Um, also during our talking circle, we're gonna be utilizing the raise hand feature, which is on the bottom of your screen. And Paul and I will be working with those of you who are raising your hand uh, to be part of the talking circle. So please uh, use that function and, and your patience is appreciated because we have very many participants for tonight. And uh, I will hand it off. Thank you very much, Paula. Thanks, Ellen. So folks, sometimes um, the system gets taxed. Um, Perry, can you spotlight me for a second? Thanks, sir. Sometimes the system gets taxed or your screen or the person speaking screen freezes or the audio goes out and we'll just try to hold and see if it comes back, right? You might get booted off the system. It totally happens. Just try to get yourself back on. I might be boot booted off and I will fight my way to get back to you. If you do get booted off, um, we might not know. Um, I won't be checking my email. So just keep trying to get on using the link or the meeting ID. And if you're a listener and you can't get back on, you can go to McCarter's or to the Bayard Rustin Center's live Facebook feed to continue to watch. Um, the event. And don't worry, everyone. Things happen. Remember, it's not about perfection. Just a few final words on um, community readings, intentions, and mechanics. Folks, this is a play reading and not a performance. It's what we call in the business a cold reading in that it has not been rehearsed. This is also a community reading, so no theatrical or, uh, or performance experience, as I said before, is presumed. This is not a performance. We're here to read the dramatic work of playwright Emily Mann and the words of the people of San Francisco. As a documentary theater piece, the words in the play are the authentic words of the people who spoke them and all their beauty and thoughtfulness, as well as in their ugliness and ignorance. So we'll honor the words, understanding that words have power. And tonight, those of, you, of us who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or queer will continue our reclamation of words intended to disempower, hurt, and demean us. Again, this isn't a performance. We're not looking for perfection. Tonight is about purpose. We are here to honor the lives and spirits of Harvey and George and to tell the truth about what happened and to try to keep it from happening again. A quick word on stage directions. They will be read and I will introduce the stage direction, direction reader in just a moment. They'll be read because they're part of Emily's vision for the play. Um, there are also speaker's directions. Um, they're included with the dialogue such as laugh, nods, long wry look to the crowd, he is deeply moved, pauses or pause. Those are the individual reader's responsibility. Our stage direction reader won't read those. So imbue your performance with whatever you're given as a speaker's direction. And finally, um, in the course of the play, you will have um, experienced that um, Emily has put slashes or asterisks 
um, that are included in the dialogue. Those are indicate, intended to indicate overlapping dialogue, but don't worry about that. In fact, we ask you not to try and overlap the dialogue because as a community reading, we wanna make sure that those who are not reading or uh, along with us are able to hear all of the words um, and understand every word. Um, I think we already did the recall, I mean the roll call. If you are joining us late and you are a reader, you may have already had your roll recast. Um, so um, chat with me if you need to in the chat. Um, but I think we're, I think we have recast fully. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn this event over to professional stage manager and member of the McCarter family for 29 seasons, Cheryl Mintz who will be reading stage directions and in general holding us all together, which is one of the many superpowers of stage managers like Cheryl. So Cheryl, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Places please, places for the top of act one. Execution of Justice by Emily Mann. Time, 1978 to the present. Place, San Francisco. Authors note, the words come from trial transcript, interview, reportage, the street. Act one, murder. A bare stage, white screens overhead. Screen, images of San Francisco, punctuated with images of milk and Moscone. Hot, fast music. People enter, a maelstrom of urban activity. Screen, without warning, Documentary footage of Diane Feinstein, almost unable to stand. As president of the Board of Supervisors, it is my duty to make this announcement. Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. Gasps and cries, a long moment. <clears throat> the suspect is Supervisor Dan White. The crowd is in shock. They cannot move. Then they run. In the chaos, Marianne White enters, trying to hail a cab, exits. Screen, a crucifix fades up. Shaft of light, a church window. Dan White prays. Audio, hyper-realistic sounds of mumbled Hail Marys, of high heels echoing, moving fast, of breathing hard, running. Marianne White enters, breathless. Dan White looks up. She approaches him. I shot the mayor and Harvey. Marianne White crumples. Lights change. This is the matter of the people versus Daniel James White. Amplified gavel. Lights change. Yeah, I'm wearing a free Dan White t-shirt. You haven't seen what I've seen. My nose shoved into what I think stinks. Against everything I believe in, you know, there was a time in San Francisco when you knew a guy by his parish. Sister Boom Boom enters. Nun drag, white face, heavenly made up, spike heels. Sometimes I sit in church and I think of those disgusting drag queens dressed up as nuns and, and I'm a cop and I'm thinking there's gotta be a law, you know? because they're making me think things I don't want to think. And I got to keep my mouth shut. Boom Boom puts out a cigarette. Taking a guy out of his sling, fist fucked to death, they say it's mutual consent, it ain't murder. And I pull this disgusting mess down and take him to the morgue. <laughs> I mean, my wife asks, hey, how was your day? I can't even tell her. I wash my hands before I can even look at my kids. The cop and Boom Boom are very aware of each other, but never make eye contact. God bless you one. God bless you all. See, Danny knew. He believes in the rights of minorities, you know? He just felt we are a minority too. I would like to open with a reading from the Book of Dan. We've been working this job three generations. My father was a cop. And then they put Muscone, Jesus, Muscone, with this Negro-loving, faggot-loving chief telling us what to do. He doesn't even come from their neighborhood. He doesn't even come from the city. He's telling us what to do in a force that knows what to do. 
He makes us paint our cup cars faggot blue. He called it lavender gloves for queers. Handle them, treat them with lavender gloves, he called it. He's cutting off our balls. The city is stinking with degenerates. I, I mean, I'm worried about my kids. I worry about my wife. I worry about me and how I'm feeling mad all the time. You gotta understand that I'm not alone. It's real confusion. As he came to his day of reckoning, he feared not, for he went unto the lawyers and the doctors and the jurors, and they said, take heart, for in this you will receive not life, but three to seven, with time off for good behavior. Close his book reverently. You gotta understand. Take a walk with me sometimes. See what I see every day. Now we are all faced with this cycle. Like I'm supposed to smile when I see two bald-headed, shaved-head men with those tight pants and muscles and chains everywhere, French kissing on the street. Hmm. Putting their hands all over each other's asses. I'm supposed to smile, walk by, as if this is right? As gay people and as people of color and as women, we all know the cycle of brutality which pervades our culture. I got nothing against people doing what they want. If I don't see it. And we all know that brutality only begets more brutality. I mean, I'm not making some woman on the street for everyone to see. Violence only sows the seed for more violence. I'm not. And I hope Dan White knows that. I can't explain it any better. Because the greatest, most efficient information gathering and dispersal network is the great gay grapevine. Just take my word for it. And when he gets out of jail, no matter where Dan White goes, someone will recognize him. Walk into a leather bar with me some night. They, they there are queers who'd agree with me. It's disgusting. All over the world, the word will go out and we will know where Dan White is. The point is, Dan White showed you you could fight City Hall. Now we are all aware, as I said, of this cycle of brutality and murder. And the only way we can break that horrible cycle is with love, understanding, and forgiveness. And there are those who are before me here today gay brothers and sisters who said that we must somehow learn to love, understand, and forgive the sins that have been committed against us and the sins of violence. And it sort of grieves me that some of us are not understanding and loving and forgiving of Dan White. And after he gets out, after we find out where he is, I mean, not, you know, with any malice or planning. You know, you get so depressed and your blood sugar goes up and you'd be capable of just about anything. And some angry faggot or dyke who is not understanding, loving, and forgiving is going to perform a horrible act of violence and brutality against Dan White. And if we can't break the cycle before somebody gets Dan White, somebody will get Dan White. And when they do, I beg you all to love, understand, and forgive. <laughs> Lights fade to black. This is the matter of the people versus Daniel James White. And the record will show that the defendant is present with his counsel and the district attorney is present, and this is the end, and this is, this is out of presence of the jury. Courtroom being set up, TV lights. A list of prospective witnesses said that the defense had presented for the trial of the man who killed the liberal mayor of San Francisco, George Moscone, and the first avowedly gay elected official, city supervisor Harvey Milk, Reads like a hoo-hoo of the city government. Looks at the list. Judges, congressmen, current and former supervisors, and even a state senator. The DA has charged White with two counts of first-degree murder, 
invoking for the first time the clause in the new California capital punishment law that calls for the gas chamber for any person who has assassinated a public official in an attempt to prevent him from fulfilling his official duties. Ironically, Harvey Milk and George Moscone vigorously lobbied against the death penalty, while Diane White vigorously supported it. This is Joanna Liu at the Hall of Justice. Gavel, spotlight on clerk. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the information in the case now pending before you. The people of the state of California, plaintiff versus Daniel James White, defendant, action number 98663, count one. Gavel, lights up, trial in progress, screen, jury selection. Mr. Schmidt, you may continue with your jury selection. Thank you, Your Honor. It is alleged that Dan White did willfully, unlawfully, and with malice, a forethought, murdered George R. Moscone, the duly elected mayor of the city and county of San Francisco, California. Have you ever supported controversial causes like homosexual rights, for instance? Ruth, Ruth. I have uh, gay friends. I uh, once walked with them in France. I once walked with them in a gay Freedom Day parade. Your Honor, I would like to strike this juror. I am a stir. I am a heterosexual. Agreed. Gavel. The defendant, Daniel James White, is further accused of a crime of felony to wit. That said, defendant Daniel James White did willfully, unlawfully, and with malice of forethought murder Harvey Milk, a duly elected su supervisor of the city and county of San Francisco, California. With whom do you live, sir? Uh, with my roommate. Uh, what does he or she do? He works at the Holiday Inn. Your Honor, I ask the court to strike this juror for cause. Agreed. Gavel. Special circumstance, it is alleged that Daniel James White in this proceeding has been accused of more than one offense of murder. I worked briefly as a San Francisco policeman, but I've spent most of my life since then as a private security guard. As you know, serving as a juror is a high honor and responsibility. Yes, sir. The jury serves as the conscience of the community. Yes, sir. I knew that, sir. Now, sir, as a juror, you take an oath that you will apply the laws of the state of California as the judge will instruct you. Yes, sir. You'll uphold sir. that oath, won't you? Yes, sir. Now, do you hold any views against the death penalty? No matter how heinous the crime? No, sir. I support the death penalty. Why do you think Danny White killed Milk and Moscone? I have certain opinions. I'd say it was social and political pressures. I have my jury. Mr. Norman? No response. Fine with him. Gavel. The jury has been selected quickly for the Dan White trial. It appears the prosecution and the defense want the same jury. Assistant DA Tom Norman exercised only three out of 27 possible peremptory challenges. By all accounts, there are no blacks, no gays, and no Asians. One juror is an ex-policeman, another the wife of a county jailer. Four of the seven women are old enough to be Dan White's mother. Most of the jurors are working and middle-class Catholics. Speculation in the press box is that the prosecution feels it has a law and order jury. In any case, Dan White will certainly be judged by a jury of his peers. I have with me this morning, District Attorney Joseph Freitas Jr. TV lights on Freitas. May we ask, sir, the prosecution strategy in the trial of Dan White? I think it's a clear case. We'll let the facts speak for themselves. Falzone enters, sits at prosecutor's table. 
And the defendant, Daniel James White, has entered a plea of not guilty to each of the, the charges and allegations contained in this information. White enters. Marianne White enters with infant in arms. Sees him. They sit. Mr. Norman, do you desire to make an opening statement at this time? I do, Judge. All right, you may proceed. Lights change. Screen. Act one murder. Gavel. Screens go white. Your Honor, members of the jury, and you must be the judges now, counsel for the defense. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Thomas F. Norman, and I am the assistant district attorney, and I appear here as trial representative to Joseph Friedis, Jr., district attorney. Seated with me is Frank Falzone, chief inspector of homicide for San Francisco. George R. Moscone was the duly elected mayor of San Francisco. Screen, portrait of Moscone. Harvey Milk was the duly elected supervisor or city councilman of District 5 of San Francisco. Screen, portrait of Milk. The defendant in this case, Mr. Daniel James White, had been the duly elected supervisor of District 8 of San Francisco until for personal reasons of his own, he tendered his resignation in writing to the mayor on or about November the 10th, 1978, which was approximately 17 days before this tragedy occurred. Subsequent to tendering his resignation, he had the feeling that he wanted to withdraw that resignation and that he wanted his job back. George Moscone, it appears, had told the accused that he would give him his job back, or in other words, appoint him back to the board if it appeared that there was substantial support in district number eight for that appointment. Material was received by the mayor in that regard. And in the meantime, Mr. Daniel James White had resorted to the courts in an effort to withdraw his written resignation. It appears that those efforts were not met with much success. Screen, the defense, Douglas Schmidt. Ladies and gentlemen, the prosecutor has quite skillfully outlined certain of the facts that he believes will be supportive of his theory of first degree murder. Now, I intend to present all the facts, including some of the background material that will show not so much what happened on November 27th, but why those tragedies occurred on November 27th. The evidence will show, and it's not disputed, that Dan White did indeed shoot and kill George Moscone. And I think the evidence is equally clear that Dan White did shoot and kill Harvey Milk. Why then should there be a trial? The issue in this trial is properly to understand why that happened. Lights, screen, chief medical examiner and coroner for the city and county of San Francisco. In my opinion and experience counsel, the larger tattoo pattern at the side of the mayor's head is compatible with a firing distance of about one foot. And the smaller tattoo pattern within the larger tattoo pattern is consistent with the firing distance of a little less than one foot. That is, the wounds to the head were received within a distance of one foot when the mayor was already on the floor, incapacitated. Norman looks to jury. Screen. Image of figure shooting man in head from a distance of one foot, leaning down. Lights. Why? Good people, fine people with fine backgrounds, simply don't kill people in cold blood. It just doesn't happen. And obviously some part of them has not been presented thus far. Dan White was a native of San Francisco. He went to school here, went through high school here. He was a noted athlete in high school. He was an army veteran who served in Vietnam and was honorably discharged from the army. He became a policeman thereafter and after a brief hiatus, developed, again returned to the police force in San Francisco and later transferred to the fire department. He was married in December of 1976 and he fathered his son in July 1978. Dan White was a good policeman and Dan White was a good fireman. 
In fact, he was decorated for having saved a woman and her child in a very dangerous fire. But the complete picture of Dan White perhaps was not known until sometime after these tragedies on November 27th. The part that went unrecognized was, uh, for the past 10 years, Daniel White was suffering from a mental disease. A disease that Daniel White was suffering from is called depression, sometimes called manic depression. Lights. Doctor, uh, what kind of wound was that in your opinion? These are gunshot wounds of entrance counsel. The cause of death was multiple gunshot wounds, particularly the, the bullet that passed through the base of the supervisor's brain. This wound would cause instant or almost instant death. I'm now holding people's third gratification. In order for this wound to be received, counsel, the supervisor was left close to the body with a palm up. And the thumb toward the body. Can you illustrate that for us? Yes, counsel. The left arm has to be in close to the body and slightly forward with the palm up. And the right hand has to be with the thumb pointed towards the body and the elbow and slightly to the body with the arm raised. In this position, all of these wounds that I have just described in people's 30 and 29 line up. Freeze. Lights. Dan White came from a vastly different lifestyle than Harvey Milk, who was a homosexual leader and politician. Dan White was an idealistic young man, a working class young man. He was deeply endowed with and believed very strongly in the traditional American values, family and home, like the district he represented. Dan White believed people when they said something. He believed that a man's word essentially was his bond. He was an honest man and it was fair, perhaps too fair for the politics in San Francisco. Screen, white campaigning, American flag behind him. Audio, Rocky theme song, crowd response throughout his speech. Do you like my new campaign song? Yeah! <laughs> for years, we have witnessed an exodus from San Francisco by many of our family members, friends, and neighbors. Alarmed by the enormous increase in crime, poor educational facilities, and a deteriorating social structure, they have fled to temporary havens. In a few short years, these malignancies of society will erupt from our city and engulf our tree-lined, sun-bathed communities that chide us for daring to live in San Francisco. That is, unless we, who have remained, can transcend the apathy which has caused us to lock our doors while the tumult rages unchecked through our streets. Individually, we are helpless. Yet, you must realize there are thousands and thousands of angry, frustrated people such as yourselves waiting to unleash a fury that can and will eradicate the malignancies which blight our beautiful city. I am not going to be forced out of San Francisco by splinter groups of radicals, social deviates, and incorrigibles. Unite and fight with Dan White. Crowd cheers, lights change, screens, Go to white. I think Dan White saw the city deteriorating as a place for the average and decent people to live. Mr. Novenberg, please be seated. The irony is that the young man with so much promise in seeking the job on the Board of Supervisors actually was destined to construct his downfall. After Dan White was elected, he discovered there was a conflict of interest if he was a fireman and an elected official. His wife, Mary Ann, was a school teacher and made a good salary. 
But after their marriage, it was discovered that the wife of Dan White had become pregnant and had to give up her teaching job. So the family income plummeted from an excess of $30,000 to $9,600, which is what a San Francisco supervisor is paid. I believe that all the stress and the underlying mental illness culminated in his resignation that he turned into the mayor on November 10th, 1978. Screen, Mr. Nothenberg, Deputy Mayor, Lights. Would you read that for us? Dear Mayor Moscone, I have been proud to represent the people of San Francisco from District 8 for the past 10 months. But due to personal responsibilities, which I feel must take precedence over my legislative duties, I am resigning my position effective today. I am sure that the next representative to the Board of Supervisors will receive as much support from the people of San Francisco as I have. Sincerely, Dan White. It is so signed. Some days after November the 10th, pressure was brought to bear on Dan White to go back to the job that he had worked so hard for. And there was a one-way course that those persons could appeal to Dan White, and that was an appeal to his sense of honor. Basically, Dan, you are letting the fire department down, letting the police department down. Uh, it worked. That type of pressure worked because of the kind of man Dan White is. He asked the mayor for his job back. Mr. Nothenberg. Uh, on or about Monday, the 27th of November last year, do you know whether Mayor Moscone was going to make an appointment to the Board of Supervisors, particularly for District Number 8? Yes, he was. The mayor said, we have political differences, but you are basically a good man. And you worked for the job, and I'm not going to take you to fault. The letter was returned to Dan White. Do you know whom his appointee to District 8 was going to be? Yes, I do. Who was that, please? It was going to be a gentleman named Dan Don Horenzi. Jack? Jack, unmute. And start over, please. As I said, Dan White believed a man's word was his bond. Mayor Moscone had said if there was any legal problem, he would simply reappoint Dan White. Therefore, thereafter, it became Dan White. There is no support in District 8, and unless you can show some broad-based support, the job will not be given to you. And finally, the public statement coming from the mayor's office. It's undecided. But you will be notified prior to the time that any decision is made. They didn't tell Dan White. But they told Barbara Taylor. Lights change. I'm Barbara Taylor from KCBS. Uh, I'd like to speak to Dan White. Yeah? Uh, I have received information from a source within the mayor's office that you are not getting that job. I'm interested in doing an interview to find out your reaction to that. Mr. White? Long pause. Spotlight on White. I don't know anything about it. Audio, click, busy signal, lights change. The mayor told me the only one I've talked to who is in favor of the appointment of Dan White is Dan White. Thank you, Mr. For that phone call, Denise Apgar, Dan's aide, told Dan White that there were going to be supporters down at City Hall the next morning to show support to the mayor's office. In one day, they had collected 1,100 signatures in District 8 in support of Dan White. But the next morning, Denise called Dan and told him the mayor was unwilling to accept the petitioners. Screen, Denise Apcar, aide to Dan White. Yes, I told Danny, I don't remember my exact words, that the mayor had circumvented the people. Did you believe at that time that the mayor was going to appoint someone other than Dan White? Oh, yes. And at that time, were your feelings such that you were angry? Definitely. Well, the mayor had told him 
And Dan always felt that a person was going to be honest when they said something. He believed that up until the end. You felt and believed that Mr. Milk had been acting to prevent the appointment of Mr. Darren White to his vacated seat on the Board of Supervisors? Yes, I was very well aware of that. Had you expressed that opinion to Mr. White? Yes. Did Mr. White ever express that opinion also to you? He wasn't down at City Hall very much that week, so I was basically the person that told him these things. Did you call Mr. White and tell him that you had seen Harvey Milk come out of the mayor's office after you had been informed the mayor was not in? Yes, I did. Then he called me back and said, Denise, come pick me up. I want to see the mayor. When you picked him up, did he do anything unusual? Well, he didn't look at me, and normally he would turn his body a little bit towards the driver, and we would talk, you know, in a freedom way. But this time he didn't look at me at all. He was squinting hard. He was very nervous. He was agitated. He was blowing a lot. He was r rubbing his hands and blowing uh, and rubbing them like he was cold, like his hands were cold. He acted very hurt. Yes, he was. He, he looked like he was going to cry. He was doing everything he could to restrain his emotion. Did you ever describe him as acting all fired up? Yes. Yes, I believe I said that. Did he mention at that time that he was also going to talk to Harvey Milk? Yes, he did. Did he ever say he was going to really lay it on the mayor? It's been brought to my attention. I said that, yes. When you were driving Mr. White downtown, was there some discussion relative to a statement you made? Quote, anger had run pretty high all week towards the mayor playing pool on us, dirty, you know, unquote? I believe I was describing my anger. At the time I made those statements, I was in shock and I spoke freely and I'm sure I never used those terms before. When you made those statements, it was 40 minutes after noon on November 27th, was it not? Yes. Ms. Apcar, when you were driving Mr. White to City Hall, did you know he was carrying a loaded gun? No, I did not. Thank you. Lights. Dan White went to City Hall and he took a 38 caliber revolver with him. And that was not particularly unusual for Dan White. Dan White was an ex-policeman, and as a policeman, one is required to carry off-duty a gun. And as an ex-policeman, well, I think it's common practice. And additionally, remember, this was the atmosphere created by the Jonestown People's Temple tragedy. Screens flood with Jonestown imagery, music. Which had occurred a few days before November 27th. And at that time, there were rumors that there were hit lists that had been placed on public officials in San Francisco assassination squads. And in hindsight, of course, we can all realize the fact did not happen. But at that time, there were 900 bodies laying in Guyana to indicate that, indeed, people were bent on murder. Screen, Officer Byrne, Department of Records, lights. Officer Byrne. Do persons who were once on the police force who have resigned their positions, do they have a right to carry a concealed firearm on their person? And I think it will be shown that Jim Jones himself was directly allied to the liberal elements of San Francisco politics and not to the conservative elements. No, a resigned person would not have that right. And so it would be important to understand that there were threats directed toward conservative persons like Dan White. Officer, have you at my insistence and request examined those particular records to determine whether there is an official permit issued by the Chief of Police to a Mr. Daniel James White to carry a concealed firearm? Yes, I have. What have you found? I find no permit. Thank you. Lights. Yes, it's a violation of the law to carry a firearm without a permit, but that firearm was registered to Dan White. Mr. Malia, please be seated. Upon approaching the doors on Polk Street, White observed a metal detection machine. Knowing that he did not know the man that was on the metal detection machine, he simply went around to the McAllister Street well where he 
expected to meet his aid. He did not find Denise Apgar there. She had gone to put gas in her car. He waited for several moments, but knowing that it was imminent to talk to the mayor, he stepped through a window at the Department of Public Works. Screen. Slide of windows with a man in front demonstrating procedure. Which doesn't require any physical prowess, and you can step through those windows, and the evidence will show that, though they're now barred, previously it was not uncommon for people to enter and exit there. They are very large windows and are large, wide sills. Screen shows windows he stepped through. Small, high off the ground, now barred. And it's quite easy to step into the building through these windows. Screen. Slide of a man in three-piece suit trying to get leg up. Screen. William Malia, Jr., civil engineer. At approximately 10.35, I heard the window open. I heard someone jump to the floor and then running through the adjoining room. I looked up and caught a glance of a man in a suit running past the doorway of my office into the city hall hallway. What did you do? I got up from my desk and called up after him. Hey, wait a second. Did that person wait or stop? Yes, they did. Do you see that person here in this courtroom today? Yes, I do. Where is that person? It's Dan White. Uh, he said to me I had to get in. My aide was supposed to come down and let me in the side door, but never showed up. I had taken exception to the way he had entered our office, and I replied, and you are? And he replied, I'm Dan White, the city supervisor. Um, he said, say, I got to go. And with that, he turned and ran out of the office. Did, did you say that he ran? Right. Mr. Malia, had you ever seen anyone else enter or exit through that window or those windows along that side? Yes, I had. It was common for individuals that worked in our office to do that. Were you alarmed when you learned that a supervisor crawled or walked through that window or stepped through that window? Was I alarmed? Yes. Yes, I, I was alarmed. Norman looks to jury. I think it's significant at this point, also because the fact that he crawled through the window appears to be important. It's significant to explain that people often climb through that window. And indeed, on the morning of the 27th, Denise had the key to the McAllister Street well door. So, Dan White stepped through the window, identified himself, traveled up to the second floor. Screen, Mrs. Sear Cupertini, appointment secretary to the mayor. And then approached the desk of Sear Cupertini and properly identified himself and asked to see the mayor. Lights. I am the appointment secretary to Mayor Feinstein. In November of last year, and particularly on November 27th, what was your then occupation? I was appointment secretary to the elected mayor of San Francisco, George Moscone. Mrs. Cupertini, were you aware that there was anything that was going to happen that day of November 27th of interest to the citizens of San Francisco? Uh, I mean, such as some public announcement? There was to be a news conference to announce the new supervisor to the 8th district at 1130. Mrs. Cupertini, at approximately 10.30 a.m. when you saw Mr. Daniel White, he appeared in front of your desk. Do you recall what he said? He said, hello, Sear. May I see the mayor? I said, he has someone with him, but let me go check with him. I went into the mayor and told him that Supervisor White was there to see him. He was a little dismayed. He was a little uncomfortable by it and said, Oh, all right, tell him I'll see him, but he will have to wait a couple of minutes. I asked the mayor, shouldn't I have someone in there with him? And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll see him alone. I said, why don't you let me bring Mel Wax in? And he said, no, no, I'll see him alone. And then I went back. Who was Mel Wax? The press secretary. 
when you went out to your office, did you then see Mr. Daniel White? Yes, I said it would be a few minutes. He asked me how I was and how things were going. Was I having a nice day? Was there anything unusual about his tone of voice? No, I don't think so. He seemed nervous. I asked him, would he like to see the newspaper while he was waiting? He said, no, he wouldn't. And I said, well, that's all right. There's nothing in it anyway, unless you want to read about Caroline Kennedy having turned 21. And he said, 21, is that right? He said, yeah, that's all so long ago. It's even more amazing when you think that John John is now 18. Lights change, funeral mass. Gregorian chant, boys choir, pause. The only comparable situation I ever remember. It was about that time he was admitted to the mayor's office. It was when JFK was killed. Did you tell Mr. Daniel White that he could go in? Yes. I remember that in my bones, in my body. Did he respond in any way to that? Just like this one. He said, Good girl, Seer. Good girl, Seer? Right. When Camelot all of a sudden turned to hell. And then what did he do? Went in. After he went in there, did you hear anything of an unusual nature that was coming from the mayor's office? After a time, I heard a commotion. Lights change. I heard it on the car radio. I literally gasped. Explain that to us, please. I wanted to pull over to the side of the road and scream. Well, I heard a series of noises, a, a group, and then one. Just scream. I went to the window to see if anything was happening out in the street. Then I thought of my kids. And the street was rather extraordinarily calm. I noticed when I walked outside that there was an unusual quiet. For that hour of the day, there was usually more, there wasn't really anything out there. I went to the second floor and started walking towards the mayor, mayor's office. I wanted to get them out of school and take them home. Could you describe these noises for us? I wanted to take them home and, Lock the door. Well, they were dull thuds, rather like... There was a strange combination of panic and silence that you rarely see. I thought maybe it was an automobile door that somebody had tried to shut by, you know, pushing and then finally succeeding. It was like a silent, slow-motion movie of a disaster. Do you have any recollection that you can report with any certainty to us as to how many sounds there were? No. As I stood there, I, I thought I ought to remember. As if the world had just come to an end. George loved this city and felt what was wrong could be fixed. Do you, you want a glass of water? <laughs> and I asked someone what had happened, and he said, the mayor has been shot. I want to remember that pattern in case it is something, but I... He knew it was a racist town, a Catholic town, but he believed in people's goodwill. Just a minute. Do you want a recess? He never suspected, I bet, Dan White's psychotic behavior. Do you want a recess? That son of a bitch killed someone I loved. I mean, I love the guy. No, I'm all right. Are you sure you are all right? Yes. I just thought of my kids. I loved his idealism. I loved his 
Oh. Then what happened was Rudy Nelsenberg left to tell the press that the conference would start a few minutes late. I love the guy. And then he came back to me right away and said, oh, I guess we can go ahead. I just saw Dan White leave. I love his almost naive faith in people. So then he went into the mayor's office and said, he isn't here. And I said, well, maybe he went into the back room. I loved his ability to go on. Then he just gave a shout saying, Gary, get in here, call an ambulance, call the police. So, see, I got too tired to stay in politics and do it. George and I were together from the, from the beginning. Me, Phil Burden, Willie Brown, beating all the old Irishmen. I heard right away that Dan White had done it. But George believed, as corny as this sounds, that you do good for the people. I haven't met many of those, and George was one of those. Maybe those are the guys that get killed. I don't know. <laughs> all right, all right. All this you told us about occurred in San Francisco, didn't it? Yes. Dan White, as it was quite apparent at that point, had cracked because of his underlying mental illness. Green, Carl Henry Carlson, aide to Harvey Milk. I heard Peter Narzona, Diane Feinstein's aide, say, Diane wants to see you. And Dan said, that'll have to wait a couple of minutes. I have something to do first. I have something to do first? Yes. Do you recall in what manner Mr. White announced himself? There were stress factor factors due to the fact that he hadn't been notified. He appeared at the door, which was normally left open stuck his head in and asked, say hard, can I see you for a minute? And the sudden emotional surge that he had in the mayor's office was simply too much for him. What did Harvey Milk do at that time, if anything? He turned around. And he cracked. He turned around. The man cracked. And said, sure, and got up and went across the hall. He shot the mayor to the office designated as Dan White's office on the chart. Reloaded his gun, basically on instinct because of his police training. After they went across the hall to Mr. White's office. And was about to leave the building at that point and he looked down the hall. Would you tell us what next you heard or saw? He saw somebody that he believed to be an aide to Harvey Milk. A few seconds later, probably 10, 15, Sounds later, I heard a shot or the sound of gunfire. He went down to the supervisor's area to talk to Harvey Milk. Excuse me, would you speak out? Your voice is fading a bit. At that point, in the same state of rage, emotional upheaval with the stress and mental illness having cracked this man. The left arm has to be close to the body and slightly forward with the palm up. 90 seconds from the time he shot the mayor, Dan White shot and killed Harvey Milk. After the shot, I heard Harvey Milk scream, oh no. And then the first, the first part of the second no, which was then cut short by the second shot. The, the right hand has to be palm away with the thumb pointed towards the body and the elbow and slightly to the body with the arm raised. How many sounds of shots did you hear altogether, Mr. Carlson? Five or six. I really didn't consciously count them. In this position, all of these wounds that I have just described in people 29 and 30 line up. A few moments later, the door opened. The door opened and Daniel White walked out rushed out and proceeded down the hall. Now, Mr. Carlson, when Daniel White first appeared at the office of Harvey Milk and he inquired of Harvey Milk, say, Harv, can I see you for a minute? Could you describe his tone of voice in any way? He appeared to be very normal, usual, friendly self. I didn't, I didn't feel anything out of the ordinary. It was just very typical Dan White. 
Lights change. I'd like to talk about when people are pushed to the wall. Harvey Milk was against the reappointment of Dan White. In order to understand the riots, I think you have to understand that the Dan White verdict did not occur in a vacuum. Basically, it was a political decision. It was evident there was a liberal wing of the Board of Supervisors and there was a smaller conservative wing and Dan White was a conservative politician for San Francisco. Screen, Richard Pobich, legislative assistant to Harvey Milk, lights. My address is 552A Castro Street. I don't think I have to say what their presence meant to us and what their loss meant to us. What did you do after you saw Dan White in the door of his old office, room 237? The assassinations of our friends Harvey and George were a crime against us all. Well, I was struck in my head, sort of curious as to why he'd been running. And right here, when I say us, I don't mean only gay people. And he was, it looked like he was in a hurry. I was aware of the political situation. I mean all people who are getting less than they deserve. I was aware that Harvey was taking the position to the mayor that Mr. White shouldn't be reappointed. Harvey and I had talked earlier that it would be a significant day. Lights, subliminal music. After Harvey died, I went into a depression that lasted about a year, I guess. They called it a depression anyway. I thought about suicide. Well, more than thought about it. Mr. Pavich, Mr. Milk had suggested a replacement for Dan White, hadn't he? He had, to my understanding, recommended several people and basically took the position that Dan White should not be reappointed. I lost my job. I stayed in the hospital for, I would guess, two months or so. They put me on some kind of drug that, well, it helped, I guess. I mean, I loved him and it was... Was he requesting that a homosexual be appointed? No, he was not. He stares at Schmidt, stunned. Lights change. Well, he was gone and that couldn't change. I have nothing further. Thank you. He'd never be here again. I knew that. All right. Any redirect, Mr. Norman? No. Thank you for coming, Mr. Pavich. <clears throat> it was as if Dan White had given the go-ahead. It was a free-for-all, a license to kill. I had this reoccurring dream. We were at the opera, Harvey and I. Pavich with Joanna Liu, TV Lights. It's over, already I can tell it's over. He asked me a question, a clear, queer baiting question, and the jury didn't bat an eye. I was laughing, Harvey was laughing. Dan White's going to get away with murder. Mr. Pavich. Then Harvey leaned over and whispered, when you're watching Tosca, you know you're alive. That's when I'd wake up. Abich rushes out, upset. I remember the moment I heard Harvey had been shot. And I'd realize, like for the first time, all over again, he was dead. Blackout. Hyperrealistic sounds of high heels on marble, echoing, moving fast. Mumbled Hail Marys, lights up slowly on Schmidt and Norman. From here, I think the evidence will demonstrate that Dan White ran down to Denise's office, screamed at his aide and gave to give him the key to her car. And he left. He went to a church, he called his wife, and went into St. Mary's Cathedral, prayed, and his wife got there and he told her the best he could what he remembered he had done. And then they walked together to the Northern Police Station where he turned himself in. 
ask the officer to look after his wife, ask the officer to take possession of an Irish poster he was carrying. Screen, cover of Eurus book, Ireland, a terrible beauty, desolate, haunting. And then made a statement what best he could recall had occurred. Lights. Falzon rises from his seat at prosecutor's table. Wait, I feel like hitting you in the fucking mouth. How could you be so stupid? How? I, I want to tell you about it. I want to, to explain. Yeah, okay. If you want to talk to me, I'm going to get my tape recorder, read you your rights, and do it right. The people at this time move the tape recorded statement into evidence. Screen. The confession. Today's date is Monday, November 27th, 1978. The time is presently 12.05. We're inside the homicide detail room 454 the Hall of Justice. President's Inspector Edward Erdelatz, Inspector Frank Falzone. And for the record, sir, your full name? Daniel James White. Lights. Would you... Normally, in a situation like this, uh, we ask questions. I'm aware of your past history as a police officer and also as a San Francisco fireman. I would prefer, uh, I'll let you do it in a narrative form as to what happened this morning, if you can lead up to the events of that shooting and then backtrack as to why these events took place. Well, it's just that I've been under an awful lot of pressure lately, financial pressure because of my job situation, family pressure because of uh, not being able to have the time with my family. Can you relate these pressures you've been under, Dan, at this time? Can you explain it to Inspector Erdblatt and myself? It's just that I wanted to serve the people of San Francisco well, and I did that. Then when the pressures got too great, I decided to leave. After I left, my family and friends offered their support and said, whatever it would take to allow me to go back into office, well, they would be willing to make that effort. And then it came out that Supervisor Milk and some others were working against me to get my seat back on the board. He didn't speak to me, he spoke to the city attorney, but I was in the office and I heard the conversation. I could see the game that was being played. They were going to use me as a scapegoat. Whether I was a good supervisor or not was not the point. This was a political opportunity and they were going to degrade me and my family and the job that I had tried to do and, and more or less hang me out to dry. And I saw more and more evidence of this during the week when the papers reported that uh, someone else was going to be reappointed. The mayor told me he was going to call me before he made any decision. He never did that. I was troubled, the pressure, my family again, my, my son's out to a babysitter. Dan, can you tell Inspector Erdblatz and myself what was your plan this morning? What, what did you have in mind? I, I didn't have any devised plan or anything. It's, I was leaving the house to talk to see the mayor and I went downstairs to, to make a phone call and I had my gun down there. Is this your police service revolver, Dan? This is the gun I had when I was a policeman. It's in my room and uh, I don't know. I just put it on. I. I don't know why I put it on. It's just... You went directly from your residence to the mayor's office this morning? Yes, my, my aide picked me up, but she didn't have any idea, uh, you know, that I had a gun on me or, you know, and I went in to see him and, and he told me he wasn't going to, intending to tell me about it. Then uh, I got kind of fuzzy and then just my head didn't feel right and I... Then he said, let's go into the, the back room and, and have a drink and talk about it. Was this before any threats on your part, Dan? I, I never made any threats. 
There were no threats at all. I, I, oh no. When were you, uh, how, what was the conversation? Can you explain to Inspector Erdlotz and myself the conversation that existed between the two of you at this time? It was pretty much just, you know, I asked, was I going to be reappointed? He said, no, I am not. No, you're not. And I said, why? And he told me it's a political decision and that's the end of it and that's it. Is, is this when you were having a drink in, in the back room? No, no, it's before I went into the back room and then he could obviously see, see I was obviously distraught. And then he said, let's have a drink. And I, I'm not even a drinker, you know, I don't once in a while, but I'm not even a drinker. But I just kind of stumbled in the back and he was all, he was talking and nothing was getting through to me. It was just like a, a roaring in my ears. And, and then um, it just came to me, you know, he, you, you could hear what he was saying then? Just small talk that, you know, it just wasn't registering what I was going to do now, you know, and how this would affect my family, you know, and, and just, just all the time knowing he's going to go out and, and fly to the press and, and tell him, you know, that I, I, I wasn't a good supervisor and that people didn't want me and then that was it. Then I, I just shot him. That was it. It was over. What happened after you left, Dan? Well, I, I left his office by one of the back doors and I was going down the stairs and then I saw Harvey Milk's aid and then it struck me about what Harvey had tried to do and I said, well, I'll go talk to him. He didn't know I had, I had heard his conversation, he was all smiles and stuff. And I, I went in and, you know, I, I didn't agree with him on a lot of things, but I was always honest, you know? And here they were devious. I started to say, you know, how hard I worked for it and what it meant to me and my family and then my reputation as a, as a hard worker, good, honest person. And he just kind of smirked at me as if to say, too bad. And then, and then I just got all flushed and, and hot and I shot him. This, this occurred inside your room, Dan? Yeah, in my office. Yeah. And when you left there, did you go back home? No, no, no. I drove to the, the doggy diner on, on Van Ness. I climbed, I called my wife and she, she, didn't know she <laughs> did, did, did you tell her then? I called up. I I didn't tell her on the phone. I just said she was work see she was working sons at a babysitter. Shit. I just told her to meet me at the cathedral. St. Mary's. She took a cab. Yeah. She didn't know I, she, she knew I'd been upset and I wasn't even talking to her at home because I just couldn't explain how I felt and she had no, nothing to blame about it. She was, she's always been great to me, but it was just the pressure hitting me and just my head's all flushed and expected that my skull's going to crack. Then when she came to the church, I, I told her and she kind of slumped and she, she couldn't say anything. <laughs> how, how is she now? Do you, do you know? Is she? Do you know where she is? I don't. I don't know now. She. She came to Northern Station with me. She asked me not to do anything about myself. You know that she. She loved me, and she'd stick by me, and not to hurt myself. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add at this time? Just that I've been honest and worked hard, never cheated anybody or, you know, I'm not a crook or anything and I wanted to do a good job. I'm trying to do a good job and 
I saw the city as it's going kind of downhill and I was always just a lonely vote on the board and try to be honest and and I just couldn't take it anymore and that's it. Hey, Inspector Erdlitz. Dan, right now, are you under a doctor's care? No. Are you under any medication at all? No. When is the last time you had your gun with you prior to today? I guess it was a few months ago. I, I was afraid of some of the threats that were made and I, I just wanted to make sure to protect myself. You know, this, this city isn't safe, you know. And there's a lot of people running around and well, I, I don't have to tell you fellows. I mean, you guys know that. When you left your home this morning, Dan, was it your intention to confront the mayor, Supervisor Milk, or anyone else with that gun? No, I, I, what I wanted to do was talk, just talk to him. You know, I, I, uh, I don't, didn't even know if I was going to be reappointed or, or not be reappointed. Why we do things, you know, why did I, I don't know. No, I, I just wanted to talk to him, that's all. And at least have him be honest with me and tell me why he was doing it. Not because I was a bad supervisor or, or anything, but you know, I never killed anybody before. I never shot anybody. Why did- I didn't even, I didn't even know if I wanted to kill him. I just shot him. I don't know. What type of gun is that you were carrying, Dan? It's a 38, a two inch 38. And do you know how many shots you fired? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I, I out of instinct when I, I reloaded the gun, uh, you know, it's just the training. I guess I had, uh, you know. Where did you reload? I reloaded in my office when, when I was, I couldn't out in the hall. And how many bullets did you have with you? I, I, I don't know. I, uh, the gun was loaded and, and I had some, uh, extra shots, you know, I just, I, cause I kept the gun with, with a box of shells and just grabbed some. Inspector Falzen? No, uh, no questions. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, Dan, before we close this statement? Well, it's just that I never in really intended to hurt anybody. It's just these past several months, it got to the point I couldn't take it and I never wanted the job for ego or, you know, perpetuate myself or anything like that. I was just trying to do a good job for the city. Inspector Erlotz and I uh, appreciate your cooperation and the truthfulness of your statement. Lights change. White sobbing. Mary Ann White sobbing. Jurors sobbing. Falzon moved. I think that's all. You may examine. Do you want to take a recess at this time? Why don't we take a brief recess? Let me admonish you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, not to discuss this case among yourselves, nor with anyone else, nor allow anyone to speak to you about the case, nor are you to form or express an opinion until the matter has been submitted to you. House lights up, screen, recess. Oh. oh, you guys, you are so amazing. That was so beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is Emily. <laughs> the playwright. We're going to take a two-minute stretch, everyone. So please, if you need to run to the facilities, do so now. And we'll regroup in two minutes. Thank you so much. What a beautiful reading. Well done.
I'm going to read some of the comments that um, are in the chat in case um, not everyone um, has had an opportunity to see that. Um, from Rob, everyone tonight is extraordinary and what a true sharing of spirit and energy. Um, incredible performance of Dan White. Dan White gets a Tony. Richard, what a fabulous reading. Thank you. Uh, great job, Lisa P. Riveting. Clap, clap, clap from Tom G. Wonderful work from Eve. What a beautiful from Drell. Bravo from Rebecca to everyone. Perry notes. This is going good. Stream is good. Oh, you don't need to spotlight me, Perry, but thank you. Wonderful performance from, uh, I'm forgetting who's playing William Melia. I'm so sorry. You can chime in if you want. Wonderful performances, Dan White. So proud to have had the opportunity to, jo to join in. Oh, wow. The playwright's back. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Hi, Paula. I'm just going to do a quick check of the room to see. One minute till places. <laughs> One minute till places, please. Thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate you so much. Paula, am I reading Boom Boom in the second act? Still? You are, my friend. Thank you so much. Um, our dear, wonderful Harmonica Sunbeam, who read um, yeah. Boom Boom in the first act, actually has is double booked for tonight. So, boom, I understand boom, why. Uh, Harmonica Sunbeam is, is off to another event and sends okay. love to all. There was a lot of love for Harmonica in the Facebook chat as well. And we have some really nice messages from Emily Z. The performance is fantastic, just heartbreaking. As well as Peter Kay said, what a beautiful job, just as shattering now as it was at its premiere. Thanks, Andrea. That's our fabulous Andrea, everyone, who's working the McCarter Facebook page tonight. Thank you. Cheryl, when you're ready, I think we're good to go. Company, the call is places, places, please, for the top of Act Two. Places, please, for the top of Act Two. The call is places. Act Two. In defense of murder, audience enters. Screen, documentary images of Milk and Moscone. My late father was a guard at San Quentin and who I was visiting one day and who showed to me and then explained the function of the, uh, the death chamber. And it just seemed inconceivable to me, though I was pretty young at the time, that in this society they had been trained to believe that was the most effective and efficient of all societies that the only way we could deal with violent crime would be to do the ultimate ourselves, and that's to governmentally sanction the taking of another person's life. Two days after I was elected, I got a call, and the voice was quite young. It was from Altoona, Pennsylvania, and the person said, thanks. And you've got to elect gay people so that that young child and the thousands upon thousands like that child know that there's hope for a better world. There's hope for a better tomorrow. Without hope, they'll only gaze at those blacks, the Asians, the disabled, the seniors, the yuses. The yuses. Without hope, the yuses give up. I know that you cannot live on hope alone. Mm -mm. But without it, life is not worth living. And you, and you, and you, got to give them hope. Thank you very much. Lights up, courtroom, Falzone on witness stand, Dan White at defense table sobbing, Marianne White behind him sobbing, five jurors sobbing. Well, it's just, I, I never really intended to hurt anybody. It's just these past several months, it got to the point I couldn't take it. And I never wanted the job for ego or, you know, perpetuate myself or anything like that. I was just trying to do a good job for the city. Inspector Erdelatz and I uh, appreciate your cooperation and the truthfulness of your statement. Falzone switches tape off. I think that is all you may examine. Lights change. Screen. Inspector Frank Falzone, witness for the prosecution. 
screen, act two, in defense of murder. Inspector Falzon, you mentioned that you had known Dan White in the past, prior to November 27th, 1978? Yes, sir, quite well. About how long have you known him? According to Dan, it goes way back to the days we attended St. Elizabeth Grammar School together. But we went to different high schools. I attended St. Ignatius, and he attended Riordan. He walked up to me one day at the Jackson playground with spikes over his shoulders, glove in his hand, and asked if we could play on my team. I told him it was the police team, and he stated that he was a new recruit at Northern Station, wanted to play on the police softball team. And since that day, Dan White and I have been very good friends. You know him fairly well then, that is fair? As well as I know anyone, I believe. Can you tell me, when you saw him first on November 27th, 1978, how did he appear physically to you? Destroyed. This was not the Dan White I had known, not at all. That day, I saw a shattered individual, both mentally and physically in appearance, who appeared to me to be shattered. Dan White, the man I knew prior to Monday, the 27th of November, 1978, was a man among men. Knowing, with regard to the shootings of Mayor Moscone, and Harvey Milk, knowing Dan White as you did, is he the type of man that could have premeditatedly and deliberately shot those people? Objection as calling for an opinion and conclusion. Sustained. Knowing him as you do, have you ever seen anything in his past that would lead you to believe he was capable of cold-bloodedly shooting somebody? Same objection. Sustained. Your Honor, at this point, I have anticipated that maybe there would be some argument with regard to opinions, not only as to Inspector Falzon, but with a number of other witnesses that I intend to call. And accordingly, I've prepared a memorandum of what I believe to be the appropriate law. I have no quarrel with your authorities, but I, I think the form of the questions that you asked were objectionable. The questions were calculated to bring out an opinion on the state of mind, and I believe that a lay person, if he is an intimate acquaintance, surely can hazard such an opinion. I believe that Inspector Falzon, as a police officer, has an opinion. Get the facts from this witness. I'll let you get those facts, whatever they are. All right, we will try that. Inspector Falzon, again, you mentioned that you were quite familiar with Dan White. Can you tell me something about the man's character as to the man you knew prior to the, prior to November 27th, 1978? Object. Objection as being irrelevant and vague. Overruled. Do you understand the question? I do, basically, Your Honor. All right, you may answer it. Well, Your Honor, character for what? Overruled. You may answer it. The Dan White that I knew prior to Monday, November 27th, 1978, was a man who seemed to excel in pressure situations. And it seemed like the greater the pressure, the more enjoyment that Dan had, exceeding at what he was trying to do. Examples would be in his sports life that I can relate to. And for the first time in the history of the state of California, there was a law enforcement softball tournament held in 1971. The San Francisco Police Department entered the softball tournament along with other major departments, Los Angeles included. And Dan White was not only named on the all-star team at the end of the tournament, but named the most valuable player. He was just outstanding under pressure situations when men would be on base and that clutch hit was needed. At the end of the tournament, a dinner was held. The umpires were invited 
and one individual had umpired baseball games for over 30 years, made the comment that Dan White was the best baseball player he had ever seen participate in any tournament in South Lake Tahoe. Another example of Dan White's attitude toward pressure was that when he decided to run for the District 8 supervisor seat. And I can still vividly remember the morning he walked into the homicide detail and sat down to announce that he was going to run for city supervisor. I said, how are you going to do it, Dan? Nobody heard of Dan White. How are you going to go out there, win this election? He said, I'm going to do it the way people want it to be done. Knock on their doors, go inside, shake their hands, let them know what Dan White stands for. He said, Dan White is going to represent them. There will be a voice in City Hall. You watch, I'll make it. He did what he said he was going to do. He ran, won the election. Given these things that you mentioned about Dan White, was there anything in his character that you saw of him prior to those tragedies of the 27th of November that would have led you to believe that he would ever kill somebody cold-bloodedly? Objection irrelevant. Overruled. Let me state my ground, Your Honor, for the record. Overruled. Thank you, Judge. It's irrelevant and called for his opinion and speculation. Overruled. You may answer that. Yes, Your Honor. I am aware. I'm hesitating only because there was something I saw in Dan's personality that didn't become relevant to me until I was assigned this case. He had a tendency to run occasionally from situations. I saw this flaw and I asked him about it. And his response was that his ultimate goal was to purchase a boat, just travel around the world, get away from everybody. And yet the Dan White that I was talking to was trying to be involved with people, constantly being a fireman, being a policeman, being a supervisor, he wanted to be helpful to people, and yet he wanted to run away from them. That didn't make sense to me. Today, this is the only flaw in Dan White's character that I can cite up here and testify about. Otherwise, to me, Dan White was an exemplary individual, a man that I would be proud to know and be associated with. Do you think he cracked? Do you think there was something wrong with him on November 27th? Objection as calling for an opinion and speculation. Sustained. I have nothing further. Inspector, I have one last question. Did you ever see him act out of revenge the whole time you have known? Objection that calls for speculation. No, 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 overruled. And this is as to his observations and contacts. Overruled. The only time Dan White could have acted out in revenge is when he took the opposite procedure in hurting himself by quitting the San Francisco Police Department. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. Inspector Falzone, you regard yourself as a close friend to Mr. Daniel White, don't you? Yes, sir. Do you regard yourself as a very close friend of Mr. Daniel White? I would consider myself a close friend of yours, if that can relate to your closeness with Dan Wright. Of course, you haven't known me as long as you have known Mr. Daniel White, have you, Inspector? Just about the same length of time, Counsel. Inspector Falzone, while you've expressed some shock at these tragedies, would you subscribe to the proposition that there's a first time for everything? It's obvious in this case. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you. He sits. Falzone leaves the witness stand and takes his seat beside him at the prosecutor's table. Prosecution rest. Lights change. Screen. The prosecution rests. Commotion in court. Order. Lights. Fritas alone. I was the DA. Obviously, in some respects, the trial ruined me. This trial. Screen. 
Pictures of White as Fire Hero. Screen, The Defense. Subliminal music, Lights Up. Four character witnesses dressed as city supervisor in a suit, fire chief, police officer, fireman. Dan White was an excellent firefighter. And in fact, he was commended for a rescue at Geneva Towers. The award hasn't been given to him uh, as yet. Uh. Dan White was the valedictorian of the fire department class. He was voted so by members of the class. Screen, still of White as a valedictorian. When I was in the hospital, what got me the most was the picture of Dan White as the All-American boy. But a meritorious advisory board and fire commission were going to present Mr. White with a Class C medal. Screen, still, of White as a fire hero. Everybody liked Dan. Did you work with Dan as a policeman? Yes, I did. Maybe, as a gay man, I understand the tyranny of the All-American boy. Screen, still, of white as a police officer. He loves sports, and I love sports. Screen, still, of white as a Golden Gloves boxer. Dan White as a police officer was a very fair police officer on the street. Maybe because I was so often his victim. Oh, I followed the trial in the papers. Having had the experience of being a police officer, is it unusual for persons that have been police officers to carry guns? Uh, pardon me, Mr. Schmidt? And I thought then something was very wrong with this picture. I say it, it is uncommon that ex-police officers would carry guns. Something was wrong, we thought, when the chief inspector of homicide became the chief character witness for the defense. No, it is a common thing that former police officers will carry guns. Why didn't the chief inspector of homicide ask Dan White how he got into City Hall with a loaded gun? Without a permit? Yes. White reloaded after shooting the mayor. If it was reflex police training, why didn't he reload the gun after shooting Harvey Milk? Is there anything in his character that would have led you to believe he was capable of shooting two persons? Objection. Overruled. No, nothing whatever. <clears throat> and what can explain the coup de grace shots that White fired into the backs of their heads as they lay there helpless on the floor? And in my opinion, was a person who saved lives. Where is the prosecution? I mean, I would have remained in politics, except for this. I was voted out of office. Supervisor Dolson, you saw him on November 27th, 1978, did you not? I did. In hindsight, you know, I would have changed a lot of things. What did you see? But hindsight is always perfect vision. Screen, still, of white as city supervisor outside City Hall. What I saw made me want to cry. Dan was always so neat, looked like a Marine on parade, and he made me feel ashamed of the way I usually looked. And here he was, this kid who was badly disheveled, looked like he had been crying. What pressures were you under indeed? And he had his hands cuffed behind him, which was something I never expected to see. He looked crushed. Looked like he was absolutely devastated. And as the victim sat in the courtroom, shielded by bulletproof glass, we heard of policemen and firemen sporting free Dan White t-shirts as they raised $100,000 for Dan White's defense fund. And the same message began appearing in spray paint on walls around the city. Free Dan White! I put my arms around him told, him, told him that everything was going to be all right, but how everything was going to be all right, I don't know. Marianne White sobs. And the trial was still happening. 
Thank you. I have nothing further. Dolson sobs. <laughs> but the tears at the Hall of Justice are all for Dan White. All exit. Lights change. Fritas alone in the empty courtroom, nervous, fidgeting. I was voted out of office. Screen. Joseph Fritas, Jr., former DA. Well, I'm out of politics, and I don't know whether I'll get back into politics, because it certainly did set back my personal uh, aspirations as a public figure dramatically. I don't know. You know, there was an attempt to not allow our office to prosecute the case, because I was close to Moscone myself, and we fought against that. I was confident. <laughs> I chose Tom Norman because he was the senior homicide prosecutor for 20 years and he was quite successful at it. I don't know. There was a great division in the city then, you know? The city was divided all during that period. George was a liberal Democrat and Dick Hongisto. I was considered a liberal Democrat and George, as you'll remember, was elected mayor over John Barbagelata, who was the leader of what was considered the right in town. And it was a narrow victory. So after his election, Barbara Gelada persisted in attacking them and keeping, I thought, keeping the city divided. It divided on emerging constituencies like the gay constituency. That's the one that was used to cause the most divisive emotions more than any other. So the divisiveness in the city was there I mean, that was the whole point of this political fight between Dan White and Moscone and Milk. The fight was over who controlled the city. The right couldn't afford to lose Dan. He was their swing vote on the board of supervisors. He could block the Milk Moscone agenda. That was why Milk didn't want Dan White on the board. So it was political, the murders. Maybe I should have. Again, in hindsight, possibly Tom, even though his attempts to do that may have been ruled inadmissible, possibly Tom should have been a little stronger in that area. But again, at the time, I mean, even the press was shocked at the outcome. But, well, I think that what the jury had already bought was White's background. Now that's what was really on trial. Dan White sat there and he waved his little American flag and they acquitted him. They convicted George and Harvey. Now, if this had been a poor black or a poor Chicano or a poor white janitor who'd been fired or the husband of an alleged girlfriend of the Moscone's, I don't think they would have bought the diminished capacity defense. But whereas they have a guy who was a member of a county board of supervisors who left the police department, who had served in the army, who was a fireman, who played baseball. I think that's what they were caught up in. That kind of person must have been crazy to do this. I would have interpreted it differently. Not to be held to a higher standard, but uh, that he had all the tools to be responsible. One of the things people said was, why didn't you talk more about George's background, his family life, etc." Well, one of the reasons is that Tom Norman did know that, had he opened up that area. They were prepared. Yeah, they were prepared to smear George, bring up the incident in Sacramento with a woman and other things. It would be at best a wash. So why get into it? if you know they're gonna bring out things that aren't positive. We wanted to let the city heal. We, and after Jonestown, well, it would have been the city on trial. If the jury had stuck to the facts alone, I mean, the confession alone was enough to convict him. I mean, look at this kid that shot Reagan. It was the same thing. All the way through that, they said, my friends, well, Christ, look at what the prosecutors went through on this one, Joe. It's tragic that this has to be the kind of experience that will make you feel better. And then about White being anti-gay, well, White inside himself may have been anti-gay, but that milk was his target. As I say, malice was there. Milk led the fight to keep White off the board. <laughs>
which makes the murder all, all the more rational. I know the gay community thinks the murder was anti-gay, political in that sense, uh, but I think it's wrong. You know, some people in the gay community uh, even said I threw the trial. Huh. Before this, I was considered a great friend to the gay community. Why would I want to throw the trial? This trial in an election year? Oh, there were some accusations you wouldn't believe. At the trial, a woman, it may have been one of the jurors, I can't remember, actually mm. said, but what would Marianne White do without her husband? And I remember my outrage. She never thought, what will Gina Moscone do without George? I must tell you that it's hard for me to talk about a lot of these things. All of this is just, just the tip of the iceberg. We thought, Tommy and I, Tom Norman and I, we thought it was an open and shut case of first degree murder. Lights. It wasn't just an automatic reaction when he fired those last two shots into George Moscone's brains, was it, Doctor? Let's move on, Mr. Norman. You're just arguing with the witness now. Your Honor. Let's move on. Screen. The psychiatrist's defense. Lights up. Psychiatrist's conservative dress in either separate witness stands or a multiple stand unit. I think he was out of control and in an unreasonable stage. And I think if the gun had held, you know, maybe more bullets, Maybe he would have shot more bullets. I don't know. This wasn't just some mild case of the blues. I think that, you know, maybe Mr. Moscone would have been just as dead with one bullet. I don't know. I think he was out of control. Yes. George Moscone was shot four times, Doctor. The gun had five cartridges in it. Does that change your opinion in any way? No. I think he just kept shooting for a while. Norman throws his notes down. Now, there is another legal term we deal with in the courtroom, and that is variously called malice or malice aforethought. And this must be present in order yeah. to convict for murder in the first degree. Okay. Let me preface this by saying I am not sure how malice is defined. I'll give you what my understanding is. Be careful getting out the tub. In order to have malice, you would have to be able to do certain things to be able to be intent to kill somebody unlawfully. You would have to be able to do something for a base and antisocial purpose. You would have to be aware of the duty imposed on you not to do that, not to unlawfully kill somebody or do something for a base antisocial purpose that involved a risk of death. And you would have to be able to act despite having that awareness of that, that you are not supposed to do that. And so you would have to know that you are not supposed to do it. And then also act despite keeping in mind that you are not supposed to do it. Is that your answer, your question? I think so. I felt that he had the capacity to do the first three, that he had the capacity to intend to kill, but that doesn't take much, you know, to try to kill somebody. It's not a highfalutin men mental state. I think he had the capacity to do something for a base and antisocial purpose. I think he had the capacity to know that there was a duty imposed on him not to do that. But I don't think he had the capacity to hold that notion in his mind while he was acting. So I think that, that the depression plus the moment, the tremendous emotion of the moment with the depression reduced his capacity for conforming conduct. As ridiculous as this sounds, even to the point of instituting to kill the mayor, what he describes is more simply is striking out, not intending to kill, well, obviously, if you have a gun in your hand and you are striking out, you know you are going to cause at least some great bodily harm, if not death. But as near as I can come to the state of mind at that time, he was just, you know, striking out. In fact, I asked him, why didn't you hit them? And he was flabbergasted that I asked such a thing because it was contrary to his code of behavior. You know, he was taken aback kind of. 
hit them seemed ridiculous to him because I would have, it would have been so unfair since he could have defeated them so easily in a fist fight. Thank you. You may examine. Dr. Jones, when let off at City Hall, the accused was let off at the Polk Street entrance and then walked a block and a half to Van Ness Avenue. Why wouldn't he just enter City Hall through the main entrance? He got towards the top of the stairs, then looked up, saw the metal detector and thought, oh my goodness, I got that gun. Doctor, why would he care whether there was a metal detector there and that a gun would have been discovered upon his person? Well, I would presume that would mean some degree of hassle. I mean, I presume that the metal detector would see if somebody is trying to bring a weapon in. That is usually why they have it. Did he realize at that time that he was unlawfully carrying a concealable firearm? I presume so. Dr. Jones, if it's a fact that Dan White shot George Moscone twice in the body and that when George Moscone fell to the floor disabled, he shot twice more into the right side of George Moscone's head at a distance of between 12 and 18 inches, he made a decision at that time, didn't he? To either discharge the gun into the head of George Moscone or not discharge the gun into the head of George Moscone. If decision means he behaved in that way, then yes. Well, didn't he have to make some kind of choice based upon some reasoning process? Oh, no. Not based on reasoning necessarily, I think. I don't think that I, you know, great emotional turmoil in context of major mood disorder. He was enraged and anxious and frustrated in addition to the underlying depression. I think that after Moscone says, how's your family or what's your wife going to do? At that point, I think that it's, it's over. It's over for George Moscone. I think that if you look at the gun as a transitional object, you can see that trans transitional objects are clung to in, in situations of great anxiety and insecurity as one sees with children. Doctor, are you telling us that a person who has lived an otherwise law-abiding life and an otherwise moral life could not premeditate and deliberate as is contemplated by definitions of first-degree murder? I'm not saying that absolutely. Obviously, it's more difficult for a person who lives a highly moral life. And this individual, Dan White, had, if you want, a hypertrophy of a hypertrophy complex, hypertrophy meaning overdeveloped, rigidly, morally overdeveloped. But I would say in general, yes. I don't think you'd even kill Mr. Schmidt if you lost this case. It's unlikely. You may be very angry, but I don't think you will do it because I think you are probably a very moral and law-abiding citizen. And I think if you did it, I would certainly recommend a psychiatric examination because I think there would be a serious possibility that you had flipped. It's most interesting to me how split off his feelings were at this time. Dan White had classical symptoms that are described in diagnostic manuals for depression. And of course, he had characteristics of compulsive personality, which happened to be kind of a bad combination in those sorts of people. You are aware that he took a gun with him when he determined to see George Moscone, a loaded gun. Yes. Why did he take that gun, in your opinion, Dr. Solomon? I might say I, I think there are symbolic aspects to this. Uh, let's move to another question. Well, Your Honor. Let's move on. All right. Dr. Delman, after he went into the building, armed with the gun, through a window, and went up to see George Moscone, at the time he came in to see George Moscone, do you feel that he was angry with George Moscone? Yes. When George Moscone told him that he wasn't going to appoint him, do you think that brought about and increased any more anger? Yes. 
All right. Now, there was some point in there when he shot George Moscone. Isn't that true? Yes. Do you know how many times he shot him? I believe it's four. Well, doctor, do you put any significance upon the circumstances that he shot George Moscone twice in the head? The question is, do I put any significance in it? Yes. I really have no idea why that happened. Well, doctor, do you think he knew that if you shot a man twice in the head, that it was likely to surely kill him? I'm sure that he knew that shooting a man in the head would kill him, Mr. Norman. Thank you. But it is your conclusion, doctor, that Dan White would not premeditate or deliberate within the meaning we have discussed here on November 27th, 1978? That is correct. Lights. I teach forensic psychiatry. I teach about the uses and abuses of psychiatry in the judicial system. The courts tend to place psychiatry in a position where it doesn't belong where it becomes the sole arbiter between guilt and innocence. There is also a tendency in the stresses of the adversary system to polarize a psychiatric statement so that a psychiatrist finds himself trying to put labels on normal stressful behavior and everything becomes a mental illness. And I think that is an abuse. Dan White found City Hall rife of con con corruption, with the possible exception of Diane Feinstein and Harvey Milk. The supervisors seemed to make their judgments, their votes, on the basis of what was good for them, rather than what was good for the city. And this was a very frustrating thing for Mr. White to want to do a good job for his constituents and find he was continually defeated. In addition to these stresses, there were attacks by the press and there were threats of literal attacks on supervisors. He told me a number of supervisors like himself carried a gun to scheduled meetings, never any relief from these tensions. Whenever he felt things were not going right, he would abandon his usual program of exercise and good nutrition and start gorging himself on junk food, Twinkies, Coca-Cola. Soon Mr. White was just sitting in front of the TV. Ordinarily, he reads. Mr. White has always been an identifiable Jack London adventurer, but now getting very depressed about the fact that he would not be reappointed, he just sat there before the TV, binging on Twinkies. Screen, the Twinkie defense. He couldn't sleep. He was tossing and turning on the couch in the living room so he wouldn't disturb his wife on the bed. Virtually no sexual contact at that time. He was dazed, confused, had crying spells, became increasingly ill and wanted to be left alone. He told his wife, don't bother cooking any food for me. I will just munch on these potato chips. Mr. White stopped shaving and refused to go out of the house to help Denise rally support. He started to receive information that he would not be reappointed from unlikely sources. This was very stressing to him. Again, it got to be cupcakes, candy bars. He watched the sun come up on Monday morning. Finally, at nine o'clock, Denise called. He decides to go down to City Hall. He shaves and puts on his suit. He sees his gun lying on the table, ammunition. 
he simultaneously puts these in his pocket. Denise picks him up. He's feeling anxious about a variety of things. He's sitting in the car, hyperventilating, blowing on his hands, repeating, let him tell me to my face why he won't reappoint me. Did he think I can't take it? I am a man, I can take it. He goes down to City Hall and I sense that time is short so let me bridge this by saying that as I believe it has been testified to, he circumvents the mental detector, goes to the side window, gets an appointment with the mayor. The mayor almost directly tells him, I am not going to reappoint you. The mayor puts his arm around him saying, let's have a drink. What are you going to do now, Dan? Can you get back into the fire department? What about your family? Can you get, can your wife get her job back? What's going to happen to them now? Pause. Lights up low on Marianne White. Somehow this inquiry directed to his family struck a nerve. The mayor's voice started to fade out and Mr. White felt as if I were in a dream, he started to leave and then inexplicably turned around and like a reflex drew his revolver. He had no idea how many shots he fired. The similar event occurred in Supervisor Milk's office. He remembers being shocked by the sound of the gun going off for the second time like a cannon. He tells me that he was aware that he engaged in a lethal act, but tells me he gave no thought to his wrongfulness. As he put it to me, I had no chance to even think about it. He remembers running out of the building, driving, I think, to church, making arrangements to meet his wife, and then going from the church to the police department. Pause. Blinder exhausted. Doctor, you have mentioned the ingestion of sugar and sweets and that sort of thing. There are certain theories with regard to sugar and sweets and the ingestion thereof, and I'd like to just touch on that briefly with the jury. Does that have any significance or could it possibly have any significance? First, there is a substantial body of evidence that in susceptible individuals, large quantities of what we call junk food, high sugar content food with lots of preservatives can precipitate antisocial and even violent behavior. There have been studies, for example, where they have taken so-called career criminals and taken them off all their junk food and put them on meat and potatoes and their criminal records immediately evaporate. It's contradictory and ironic, but the way it works is that for such a person, the American dream is a nightmare for somebody like Dan White. Thank you, doctor. Lights fade on psychiatrists. Pause. Blazing white lights up on Marianne White. She is almost blinded. She comes forward. You are married to this man, is that correct? Yes. When did you first meet him? I met him. <laughs> if you want to take any time, just let us know. I met him in April 1976. And you were married and you took a trip. Yes, yes. We went to Ireland on our honeymoon because Danny just had this feeling that Ireland was like a place that was just peaceful. And he just really likes, loves everything about Ireland. And so we... <laughs> Excuse me. So, so we went there for about five weeks. During that period, did you notice anything unusual about his behavior? Yes, 
I mean, you know, when we went, I, I thought, when thinking it, it was going to be kind of romantic, and when we got there, it, it was just, all of a sudden, he went into almost like a two-week-long mood, like I had never seen before, but I had never seen one, I guess, all the way through. Because when we were going out, I, I might see him for a day, and being a fireman, he would work a day, and then I wouldn't see him. And when we got to Ireland, I mean, I was just newly married, and I thought, what did I do? After he was on the board, did you notice these moods become more frequent? Yes, he had talked to me about how hard the job was on him. You know, from June, he started to talk about how it was. Obviously, you can sense when you are not sleeping together and you are not really growing together. And he would say, well, I can't, I can't really think of anyone else when I don't even like myself. And I said, it's just him. He's not satisfied with what I'm doing and I don't like myself. And so I can't. Did you see him on the morning of November 27th? Yes, I did. And at that time, did he indicate what he was going to do that day? It was just, he was going to stay home. He wasn't leaving the house. Beat. Schmidt looks to Jerry. Later that morning, did you receive a call to meet him somewhere? Yes. Yes, I did. I went to St. Mary's Cathedral. I went and I saw him. And he walked over toward me and I, I could see that he had just been crying and I, I just kind of looked at him and he looked at me and he said, he said, I'm shot Mayor and Harvey. Thank you. Dan White sobs. Schmidt puts hand on White's shoulder. Marianne White stumbles off the stand to her husband. White shields his eyes. She looks as if she will embrace him. The defense is prepared to rest at this time. Marianne White sobs. <clears throat> Hyperrealistic sound of high heels echoing on marble. Mumbled Hail Marys. Let me admonish you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, not to discuss this case among yourselves, nor with anyone else, nor to allow anyone to speak to you about the case nor are you to form or express an opinion until the matter has been submitted to you. All exit. Screen. The defense rests. We got back from the airport the night of the 27th, and my roommate said, There's going to be a candlelight march. By now, we thought it had to have reached City Hall. So we went directly there, from the airport to City Hall. And there were maybe 75 people there. And I remember thinking, my God, is this all anybody care? Somebody said, no, the march hasn't gotten here yet. So. We then walked over to Mark's, the Market Street, which was two or three blocks away, and looked down it. And Market Street runs in a straight line out of the Castro area. And as we turned the corner, there were people as wide as this wide street, as far as you could see. Screens flooded with lights of the candles. Documentary footage of the march. We see what Milk's friend describes. Music, Barbara Adagio. The entire company enters holding candles. Thousands and thousands of people and that feeling of such loss. Music continues. It was one of the most eloquent expressions of a community's response to violence that I've ever seen. I'd like to read from the transcript of Harvey Milk's political will. 
This is Harvey Milk speaking on Friday, November 18th. This tape is to be played only in the event of my death by assassination. Screen, pictures of milk. I've given long and considerable thought to this, not just since the election. I'm thinking about this for some time prior to the election, certainly over the years. I fully realize that a, a person who stands what who stands for what I stand for, a gay activist, becomes a target for a person who is insecure, terrified, afraid, or very disturbed themselves. White enters, stops. Knowing that I could be assassinated at any moment, any time, I feel it's important that some people should understand my thoughts. So the following are my thoughts, my wishes, my desires, whatever. I'd like to pass them on and have them played for the appropriate people. The first and most obvious concern is that if I was to be shot and killed, the mayor has the power, George Moscone, of a Screen. successor. Screen, pictures of Moscone. The funeral, the mourners, the widow. My successor to the Board of Supervisors. I cannot prevent some people from feeling angry and frustrated and mad, but I hope that they would not demonstrate violently. If a bullet should enter my brain, let that bullet destroy every closet door. Gavel. All mourners blow out candles. White sits, blackout. Screen, the people's rebuttal. Screen, Dr. Levy, psychiatrist for the prosecution, lights up. I interviewed the defendant several hours after the shooting of November 27th. In my opinion, one can get a more accurate diagnosis the closer one examines the suspect after a crime has been committed. At that time, it appeared to me that Dan White had no remorse for the death of George Marsconi. It appeared to me he had no remorse for the death of Harvey Milk. There was nothing in my interview which would suggest to me there was any mental disorder. I had the feeling there was some depression, but it was not depression that I would consider as a diagnosis. In fact, I found him to be less depressed than I would have expected him to be. At that time I saw him, he, it seemed that he felt himself to be quite justified. I felt that he had the capacity to form malice. I felt that he had the capacity to premeditate and I felt he had the capacity to deliberate, to arrive at a course of conduct weighing all considerations. Did you review this transcript of the proceeding wherein the testimonies of Drs. Jones Blinder, Solomon, Delman, and Lundy were given? Yes. I found nothing in them that would cause me to revise my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Dr. Levy, are you a full professor at the University of California? No, I'm an associate clinical professor. Schmidt smiles, looks to jury. May I inquire of your age, sir? I am 55. Huh. Doctor, your report is dated November 27th, 1978, is it not? Yes. And yet the report was not written on November 27th, 1978. Well, no, it would have been written within days of that time. And then it was dated November 27th, 1978. Yes. Well, regardless of the backdating or whatever, when did you come to your forensic conclusion? I'd say the conclusions would have been on November 27th. And that was after a two hour talk with Dan White? Yes. Doctor, would it be fair to say that you made some snap decisions? I don't believe I did. Did you consult with any other doctors? No. Did you review any of the witnesses' statements? No. Did you consult any of the material that was available to you, save and except for the tape? of Dan White on the same date? No, that was all that was made available to me at, at, at that time. Now, I don't mean to be facetious, but this is a fairly important case. Is that fair? 
I would certainly think so, yes. But you didn't talk further with Mr. White. No, I, I was not requested to. And you didn't request to talk to him further? No, I was not going to do a complete assessment. Well, in fact, you didn't do a complete assessment. Is that fair? I was not asked to do a complete assessment. Doctor, you're fading away. I was not asked to do a complete assessment. Thank you. Blackout. Commotion in court. She wants to tell the story, so it's not responsive to the questions. Lights up. Screen. Supervisor Carol Ruth Silver, witness for the prosecution. He asked in what other case did a dispute between Dan White and Harvey Milk arise? And it was the Polk Street closing was another occasion when Harvey requested that Polk Street, which is a heavily gay area in San Francisco, I am sure everybody knows, and on Halloween had traditionally had a huge number of people in costumes and so forth down there, and has traditionally been recommended for closure by the police department. And- I am going to object to this, Your Honor. It was recommended. Just ask the next question. I'm sorry. Did Mr. Milk and Mr. White take positions that were opposite to each other? Yes. Was there anything that became, well, rather loud and perhaps hostile in connection or consisting between the two? Not loud, but very hostile. You have to first understand that this street closure was recommended by the police chief and had been done customarily in the years past and is, was, came up as an uncontested issue practically. Your Honor, I again. Please just make your objection. I'd like to. Without going through contortions. There is an objection. All right, sustained. Ms. Silver, did you know or did you ever see Mr. White to appear to be depressed or to be withdrawn? No. Thank you. Silver flabbergasted. Upset. All right. All right. Any questions, Mr. Schmidt? Is it Miss Silver? Yes. Miss Silver, you never had lunch with Dan White, did you? Did I ever have lunch? George was uh, socially brilliant in that he could find the injustice. I mean, the two of you. Yeah. I don't recall having done so, but I... His didn't... mind went immediately to what can, what can he, we do? Did you socialize frequently? What, what can, can we, we practically, practically do? No, when his son was born, I went to a party at his house, that kind of thing. Did Mr. Norman contact you last week or did you contact him? Rather like the image like of Robert old, Kennedy. Hold, please. Hold, please. Sorry. Sally? Whatever. Sally, we're going to continue with you. I picked up the line just because I think you were on mute. And then Tom, who was our first act, uh, okay. Moscone's Sorry. friend. So we're going to turn it over to you, Sally. Cheryl, can you give us a line for oh. Sally to start on? Rather like yes. the image of Robert Kennedy in Mississippi in 1964. On Friday morning, I called his office to... You know, he'd never seen that kind of despair before. Because I was reading the newspaper. Yes. But when he saw it, he said... And it appeared to me... No, 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 don't tell us. This is intolerable. I, I'm sorry. Then he did something about it. The jurors are told not to read the newspaper, and I'm hoping that they haven't read the newspapers. I apologize. Okay. Miss Silver. I'm sorry. I didn't want to cut her off. No, I understand. From any other answer. I think she did complete the answer, Judge. In any event, you contacted Mr. Norman, did you not? Yes, I did. 
And at that time, you offered to Mr. Norman to round up people who could say that Dan White never looked depressed at City Hall. Is that fair? That's right. Well, I offered to testify to that effect. And I suggested there were other people who could similarly testify to that fact. In fact, you expressed it though you haven't sat here and listened to the testimony in this courtroom? No, I have never been here before Friday when I was subpoenaed and spent some time in the jury room. But to use your words, after having read, after reading what was in the paper, you said that the defense sounded like bullshit to you? That's correct. Subliminal music. I thought I would be the chief witness to the prosecution. Would that suggest then that perhaps you have a bias in this case? What was left unsaid was what the trial should have been about. I certainly have a bias. You are a political enemy of Dan White's, is that fair? No, that's not true. Before, you know, there was a lot of talk about assassinating the mayor among thuggish elements of the Police Officers Association. Did you have any training in psychology or psychiatry? And those were the ones Dan White was closest to. No more than some of the kind of CEB courses, lawyers, psychology for lawyers, kind of training. And those were the ones that Dan White was closest to. I think he knew a lot of guys would think he did the right thing. And yeah, they would make him a hero. I mean, would you be able to diagnose, say, manic depression, depressed type, or could you distinguish that from unipolar depression? No. You take it, Carol. I was Dan White's jailer for 72 hours after the assassinations. Did you ever talk to him about his dietary habits or anything like that? There were no tears. I can remember a conversation about nutrition or something like that, but I can't remember the substance of it. I don't have anything further. There was no shame. Any redirect, Mr. Norman? Yes. You got the feeling that he knew exactly what he was doing, and there was no remorse. Miss Silver, you were asked if you had a bias in this case. You knew Harvey Milk very well, and you liked him, didn't you? I did. And George Moscone. Miss Silver, speaking of a bias, had you ever heard the defendant say anything about getting people of whom Harvey Milk numbered himself? Lights up on Milk's friend. In the Polk Street debate. The night Harvey was elected, I went to bed early because it was more happiness that I had been taught to deal with. Dan White got up and gave a long diatribe. Next morning, we put up signs saying, thank you. Just a, a very unexpected and very uncharacteristic of Dan, long hostile speech about how gays and their lifestyles had to be contained and we can't encourage this kind of thing. And I'm going to object to this, Your Honor. Sustained, okay. During that, Harvey came over and told me that he had made a political will because he expected he'd be killed. And then in the same breath, he said, I'll never forget it. It works, it works. All right. That's all. The system works. Thank you. When White was being booked, it all seemed fraternal. One officer gave Dan a pat on the behind when he was booked, sort of like, hey, catch you later, Dan, pat. Any recross? Some of the officers and deputies were standing around with half smirks on their faces. Some were actually laughing. Just a couple. The joke they kept telling was Dan White's mother 
says to him when he comes home, no, dummy, I said I milk said and bologna. bologna. Not Moscone. Miss Silver, you are a part of the gay community also, are you? Myself? Yes. You mean, am I gay? Yes. No, I'm not. I have nothing further. George would have said, this is intolerable, and he have done something about it. All right, you may leave as soon as the bailiff takes the microphone off. Silver next witness for a while, shaken. Uh, next witness, please. I don't know. All I can say is if Dan White was as depressed as the defense psychiatrist said he was before he went to City Hall, then the shooting these people sure seemed to clear up his mind. Silver exits towards the door. Lou with TV lights. Miss Silver, Supervisor Silver, would you like to elaborate on Mr. White's anti-gay feelings or hostility to Harvey Milk or George Moscone? No comment right now. Silver distraught, pushes through crowd, rushes past. Did you feel you were baited? Did you have your say? I said I have no comment at this time. Uh, Mr. Norman, next witness. Nothing further. Those are all the witnesses we have to present. The people rest? Yes. Does the defense have any witnesses? Well, we can discuss it, uh, Your Honor. I am not sure there is anything to rebut. Lights. Commotion in court. Screen. The people rest. Lights up on Schmidt at the lectern. A parish priest at a pulpit. Screen. Summations. I'm nervous. I'm very nervous. I sure hope I say all the right things. I can't marshal words the way Mr. Norman can, but I believe strongly in things. Lord God, I don't say to you to forgive Dan White. I don't say to you to just let Dan White walk out here a free man. He is guilty. But the degree of responsibility is the issue here. The state of mind is the issue here. It's not who was killed, it's why. It's not who killed them, but why. The state of mind is the issue here. Lord God, the pressures. Nobody can say that the things that happened to him days or weeks preceding wouldn't make a reasonable and ordinary man at least mad, angry in some way, surely. Surely that had to have arisen, not to kill, not to kill, just to be mad, to act irrationally. Because if you kill when you are angry or under the heat of passion, if you kill, then the law will punish you and you will be punished by God. God will punish you, but the law will also punish you. Heat of passion, fogs judgment, makes one act irrationally in the very least. And my God, that is what happened at the very least. Forget about the mental illness. Forget about all the rest of the factors that came into play. At the same time, surely he acted irrationally, impulsively, out of some passion. Now, you will recall at the close of the prosecution's case, it was suggested to you this was a calm, cool, deliberating, terrible, terrible person that had committed two crimes like these, and these are terrible crimes, and that he was emotionally stable at that time, and there wasn't anything wrong with him. He didn't have any diminished capacity. Then we played these tapes he made directly after he turned himself in at Northern Station. My God, that was not a person that was calm and collected and cool and able to weigh things out. It just wasn't. The tape to just totally fogged me up the first time I heard it. It was a man that was, as Frank Falzon said, broken, shattered. This was not the Dan White that everybody had known. Something happened to him and he snapped. That's the word I use in my opening statement. Something snapped here. 
the pot had boiled over here. And people that boil over in that fashion, they tell the truth. Have the tape played again, if you can't remember what was said. He said in no uncertain terms, my God, why did I do these things? What made me do this? How on earth could I have done this? I didn't intend to do this. I didn't intend to hurt anybody. My God, what happened to me? Why? Play the tape. If everybody says that tape is truthful, play the tape. I'd agree it's truthful. With regard to the reloading and some of these little discrepancies that appeared to come up, I am not even sure of the discrepancies, but if there were discrepancies, listen to it in context. Where did you reload? I reloaded in my office, I think. And then did you leave the mayor's office? Yes, then I left the mayor's office. That doesn't mean anything to me at all. It doesn't mean anything to me at all. And I don't care where the reloading took place, but listen to the tape. It says in no uncertain terms, I didn't intend to hurt anybody. I didn't intend to do this. Why do we do these things? I don't know. It was a man desperately trying to grab at something. What happened to me? How could I have done this? If the district attorney concedes that what is on the tape is truthful, and I believe that's the insinuation we have here, then by golly, there is voluntary manslaughter. Nothing more and nothing less. Now, I don't know what more I can say. He's got to be punished, and he will be punished. He's going to have to live with this for the rest of his uh, life. His oh, child man. will live it, live with it, and his family will live with it. And God will punish him. Good reason to let him off. And the law will punish him. And they will punish him severely. But please, please, just justice. That's all. Just justice here. Now I am going to sit down and very soon, and that's it for me. And this is the type of case where, I suppose, I don't think Mr. Norman is going to do it, but you can make up a picture of a dead man, or two of them, for that matter. And you can wave them around and say, somebody is going to pay for this. And somebody is going to pay for this. Dan White is going to pay for this. But it's not an emotional type thing. I get emotional about it. But you can't because you have to be objective about the facts. I get one argument. I have made it. And if I could get up and argue again, God, we'd go on all night. I just hope that. I just hope that you'll come to the same conclusion that I have come to. And thank you for listening to me. Schmidt holds the left turn, then sits. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, having the burden of proof, I am given an opportunity a second time to address you. I listened very carefully to the summation just given to you. It appears to me, members of the jury, to be a very facile explanation and rationalization as to premeditation and deliberation. The evidence that has been laid before you screams for murder in the first degree. What counsel for the defense has done is suggest to you to excuse this kind of conduct and call it something that it isn't, to call it voluntary man manslaughter. Members of the jury, you are the triers of fact here. You have been asked to hear this tape recording again. The tape recording has been aptly described as something very moving. We all feel a sense of sympathy, a sense of empathy for our fellow man, but you are not to let sympathy influence you in your judgment, to reduce the charge of murder to something less. To reduce it to voluntary manslaughter means that you are saying that this was not murder, that this was an intentional killing of a human being upon a quarrel or heat of passion. But ladies and gentlemen, that quarrel must have been so extreme at the time that the defendant could not, was incapable of forming those quantities of thought which are malice, premeditation, and deliberation. But the evidence in this case doesn't suggest that at all. Not at all. 
if the defendant had picked up a vase or something that happened to be in the mayor's office and he hit the mayor over the head and killed him, you know? You know that argument for voluntary manslaughter might be one which you could say the evidence admits a reasonable doubt. But, ladies and gentlemen, the facts are, it was he, Dan White, who brought the gun to City Hall. The gun was not there. It was he who brought the extra cartridges for the gun. They were not found there. He went to City Hall, and when he got there, he went to the Polk Street door. There was a metal detector there. He knew he was carrying a gun. He knew that he had extra cartridges for it. Instead of going through the metal detector, he decided to go around the corner. He was capable at that time of expressing anger. He was capable of, according to the doctor, well, parenthetically, members of the jury, I don't know how they can look into your head and tell you what you are able to do, but they even said that he was capable of knowing at that time that if you pointed a gun at somebody and you fired that gun, that you would surely kill a person. He went around the corner and climbed through a window into City Hall. He went up to the mayor's office. He appeared, according to witnesses, to act calmly in his approach, in his speech. He chatted with Cy Cupertini. He was capable of carrying on a conversation to the extent that he was able to ask her how she was after having asked to see the mayor. He stepped into the mayor's office after some conversation. He shot the mayor twice in the body. Then he shot the mayor twice in the head while the mayor was disabled on the floor. The evidence suggests that in order to shoot the mayor twice in the head, he had to lean down to do it. Deliberation is premeditation. It has malice. I feel stellified to even bring this up. This is the definition of murder. He reloaded the gun wherever he reloaded the gun. It was he who reloaded it. He did see Supervisor Milk, whom he knew was acting against his appointment, and he was capable of expressing anger in that regard. He entered the supervisor's area and was told, Diane wants to see you. He said, that is going to have to wait a minute. I have to do something first. Then he walked to Harvey Milk's office, put his head in the door and said, can I see you a moment, Harv? The reply was yes. He went across the hall and put three bullets into Harvey Milk's body, one of which hit Harvey directly in the back. When he fell to the floor disabled, two more were delivered to the back of his head. Now, what do you call that but premeditation and deliberation? What do you call that realistically but a cold-blooded killing? Two cold-blooded executions. It occurs to me that if you don't call them that, then you are ignoring the objective evidence and the objective facts here. Members of the jury, there are circumstances here which no doubt bring about anger, maybe even rage. I don't know. But the manner in which that anger was felt and was handled is socially something that cannot be approved. Ladies and gentlemen, the quality of your service is reflected in your verdict. Norman sits. Joanna Liu at door stops Schmidt. TV lights. Mr. Schmidt, do you... Yes? Do you feel society would feel justice is served if the jury returns two manslaughter verdicts? Society doesn't have anything to do with it. Only those 12 people in the jury box. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, now that you've heard the evidence, we come to that part of the trial where you are instructed on applicable law. Now, in the crime of murder of the first degree, the necessary concurrent mental states are malice aforethought, premeditation, and deliberation. Now, in the crime of murder of the second degree, the necessary concurrent mental state is malice aforethought. In the crime of voluntary manslaughter, the necessary mental state is an intent to kill. 
involuntary manslaughter is an unlawful killing without malice of forethought and without intent to kill. The law does not undertake to limit or define the kinds of passion which may cause a person to act rashly, such passions as desperation, humiliation, resentment, anger, fear, rage, or any other high wrought emotion can be sufficient to reduce the killings to manslaughter, so long as they are sufficient to obscure the reason and render the average man likely to act rashly. Now, there's no malice aforethought if the killing occurred upon a sudden quarrel or a heat of passion. There's no malice aforethought if the evidence shows that due to diminished capacity caused by illness, mental defect, or intoxication, the defendant did not have the capacity to form the mental state constituting malice aforethought. Even though the killing was intentional, voluntary, premeditated, and unprovoked. A siren begins. Screen, images of the riot at City Hall, broken glass, cop cars burning, riot police, angry faces, audio, explosions. In order to understand the riots, I think you have to understand that the Dan White verdict did not occur in a vacuum. Mr. Foreman, has the jury reached verdicts in this case? That there were and are other factors which contribute to a legitimate rage that was demonstrated dramatically at our symbol of who's responsible, City Hall. Screen, images of City Hall being stormed, line of police in riot gear in front. <clears throat> Yes, it has, Your Honor. So the verdict came down and the people rioted. Uh, please read the verdicts. The people stormed City Hall. They burned police cars. Screen, image of City Hall, line of police cars in flames. The jury finds the defendant, Daniel James White, guilty of violating section 192.1 of the penal code. Then the police came into our neighborhood and the police rioted. Voluntary manslaughter for the slaying of Mayor George Moscone. Marianne White gasps. Dan White puts head in hands. Explosion, riot police enter. The police came into the Castro and assaulted gays. They stormed the elephant walk bar. One kid, he had an epileptic seizure and was almost killed for it. A cop drove a motorcycle up against a phone booth where a lesbian woman was on the phone, blocked her exit, and began beating her up. Is this a unanimous verdict of the jury? Yes, it is, Judge. No, I want to talk about when people are pushed to the wall. Will each juror say yay or nay? Violence on stage. What about the children? I know who George offended. I know who Harvey offended. Yay, 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 yay. I understand, I understand the offense. What do I tell my kids? Were the ones who were responsible seeing these things? That in this country, you serve more time for robbing a bank than for killing two people. <clears throat> yay. 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 Were they hearing these things? I understand the offense. Do they understand about people being pushed to the wall? Accountability. Yay. Yay. Assassination. Yay. I've grown up with it. I forget it hasn't always been this way. What do I say? That two lives are worth seven years and eight months in jail? I remember coming home from school in sixth grade. JFK was killed six years later. Martin Luther King is a frame of reference. Explosion. Will the foreman please read the verdict for the second count? It's a divided city. The resentment of chain charge is so similar. 
I can understand that. It's my hometown. They're changing it, you know. The people are getting caught up in the change and didn't know. You grew up in an old Irish Catholic San Francisco. They didn't know why it was like Armageddon. And Bill Malone ran the town and these guys are disrupting everything. The jury finds the defendant James, Daniel James White guilty of section 192.1 of the penal code. Voluntary manslaughter in the slaying of Supervisor Her Her Harvey Milk. Dan White gasps. Marianne White sobs. Norman flushed. Head in hands. Explosions. Violence ends. Riot police control the crowd. TV lights. No, I'm optimistic about San Francisco. Is this a unanimous decision by the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. I'm Harry Britt. I'm Harvey Milk's successor. If he just killed the mayor, he'd be in jail today. To this jury, Dan White was their son. Harvey Milk lit up my universe. What are we teaching our sons? White raises his hands to his eyes, cries. Marianne White, several jurors sob. Now, this is an example I don't use often because people will misunderstand it. But when a prophet is killed, it is up to those who are left to build the community or the church. Dan White believed in the death penalty. He should have gotten the death penalty. How do you explain the difference? But I have hope. And as Harvey said, you can't live without hope. I mean, that son of a bitch killed somebody I loved. It was an effective assassination. I loved the guy. They always are. Do they know about Stonewall? Our revenge is never to forget. The foreman walks to the defense table, gives Schmidt a handshake. Norman turns away. Dan White was examined by the psychiatrist at the state prison. They decided against therapy. Dan White had no apparent signs of mental disorder. Dan White's parole date was January 6, 1984. When Dan White left Soledad Prison on January 6, 1984, it was five years, one month, and eight days since he turned himself in at Northern Station after the assassinations of Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk. Diane Feinstein, the current mayor of San Francisco, has tried to keep Dan White out of San Francisco during his parole for fear he will be killed. The cop enters. Sister Boom Boom enters. Dan White, it's 1984 and Big Sister is watching you. Dan White reportedly plans to move to Ireland after his release. What do you do with your feelings of revenge? With your need for retribution? We will never forget. Screen. Riot images freeze. A shaft of light from church window. I would like to close with a reading from the book of Dan. Take of this and eat, for this is my defense. Raises a Twinkie, eats it, exits. Dan White was found dead of carbon monoxide poisoning <clears throat> on October 21st, 1985 at his wife's home in San Francisco, California. Lights change. Dan White faces the court. <clears throat> Mr. White. You are sentenced to seven years and eight months, the maximum sentence for these two counts of voluntary manslaughter. The court feels that these sentences for the taking of life are completely inappropriate, but that was the decision of the legislature. And again, let me repeat for the record, 
seven years and eight months is the maximum sentence for voluntary manslaughter. And this is the law. Gavel. Long pause. White turns to the audience and jury. I was always just a lonely vote on the board. I was just trying to do a good job for the city. Long pause. Audio. Hyper-realistic sounds of high heels on marble. Mumbled Hail Marys. Rustle of an embrace. Sister Boom Boom enters. Taunts police. Police raise riot shields. Blackout. Screen. Execution of justice. Gavel echoes. End of play. Oh, my. Thank you. Author, author, oh. author. <laughs> oh. Great job. That was amazing. Should we take a stretch before we start our talking circle, or shall I launch in, Paula? I think you can launch in. All right, everyone. First of all, what an amazing reading. I'm blown away. It just, you were fantastic. Um, in our talking circle, I just wanted to say that this isn't a traditional theater post-show discussion or, you know, talk back. Um, what a talking circle is, is we'll be hearing and learning from each other. The prompt I'd love you to respond to is how does the story we just told together tonight resonate with your story? I'm gonna just say it again. How does the story we just told resonate with your own? Just want to reflect on that for a moment. If you have something to share based on the prompt, please raise your Zoom hand, meaning we have to see it clearly, and uh, wait to be called upon. As there are so many people present, we ask that you limit your sharing to a few sentences so we can hear from as many people as possible. And you can use either your electronic Zoom hand or Ellen and I oh. will be looking through. Or this hand. Yes, we'll be looking through uh, the pages of people still in the room. Oh, right. To call on you. So please raise your hand and we'll. And folks that are listeners, you can turn your, your uh, video on if you'd like to join us. We'd love to hear your experience as well. And if you're joining us tonight on Facebook, the comments section is there for you as well. Looking for hands. While we're looking, Paula, mm -hmm. yes, is Emily. there any response? Is there a, anything in this, what we read tonight that resonates with you or your Absolutely. story? Absolutely. You want to share that with us? I, I found um, that my experience today centered on a line that Gwen said, not necessarily like related to my personal story, but she says, when people who regularly get less than they deserve, that was the phrase that she used. And it seems that it's a resonating truth that when people who do regularly get less than they deserve, when they start getting what they deserve, when they start being treated with equity, that it's the people who have always gotten that can't take it in that crack. And Dan's rage so captured me this night with that beautiful reading by Richard. Oh, unbelievable. 
And at the yeah. same time that I cried, I cried out of anger for him, against him. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a forgiving person, but how can you justify? How could he justify? Well, you know what's interesting? It's so beautiful, and thank you for sharing that with us. One of the things that I found interesting is that, you know, he killed himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think um, I've always felt that he felt he knew what he was doing, and he believed in the death penalty, and he thought he should have gotten the death penalty and expected to get the death penalty, and because he didn't, he gave it to himself. Emily, and, Emily Edward, yeah. Edward Erdlatz has something to say. Uh, Thank you. Edward, Edward Erdlatz. That's me. <laughs> oh, sorry, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Hello. Hi. You, you know, there were some people were putting up some, some notes about in the chat about, you know, what has changed, what, what has changed uh, since that time. And I think about it and I think, you know, uh, we think a lot more, we, we think a lot differently about mental illness now than we did at, at the time uh, that this trial took, took mm -hmm. place. I think there's, it, uh, people talk about it more openly now, thank God. Uh, there's less of a stigma, thank God. Um, yeah. And I think in some that, places. Mm. In some places. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, the idea of standing up for the underdog in, in, as Harvey Milk did uh, in, the, in this story, which is the LGBTQ com community, but the underdog is, you know, it could be any, any community. And um, having a daughter with disabilities, I especially feel um, uh, close to Harvey Milk as a, as a character for trying to, you know, uh, to help people who don't know where else to turn, who didn't know where else to turn, who didn't know where, what else to do. And I think that this piece is a, a beautiful companion piece to the, the movie Milk, which I loved. Yes. Uh, the, the movie is, you know, it's kind of a, just a reenactment, whereas this goes so much deeper into, into um, the psychology and the thought behind it. But I think that they, they, they go, go together uh, they do. Um, for those who don't know the movie that Lisa is talking about, it's called The Life and Times of Harvey Milk um, by Rob Epstein and Richard Schmeekin. And they worked with me on this play. And they're magnificent filmmakers. It's a beautiful movie about Harvey Milk. Um, I believe Glenn is next. And then um, we'll go to Ellen S. Glenn. Thank you, Gwen. Thank Glenn. You. What a Glenn. Experience and thank you uh, for for in including us all. It was just uh, such a uh, uh, an honor to be a part of it. Uh, there's a line I can't remember which character it is. I think it's Gwen, and she's talking about how angry she is, and she says as she's watching how the trial is unfolding, and says, uh, "Are they even watching? Are they even listening?" Um, and that just hit me because I feel like I've asked that question every day for the past three years in the times that we're living in. So that, that was one moment that really just went right to my heart. Oh, thank you for that. Is there anyone else who? Yes. Well, I, I'll wait to, to hear from our next um, person, but I wonder if you think about um, whether I found as the playwright not having experienced the play uh, since the last election and what's going on now in our country, the resonances of now so strongly. I, I don't know if any of you, the rest of you did. And who's next? Yes. We have an Ellen S. I would like to share. Ellen. Uh, hi, I was actually um, applauding. Uh, your mention of the movie and the discussion and um, not actually raising my hand. But I am glad to hear because I was wondering as this was happening, um, if there was any interaction with the movie, how you 
Um, you said that you did some work together um, mm -hmm. because I thought the movie was so Beautiful. I just remember seeing the candlelight. <laughs> Well, Which that's is mentioned um, in the screen. how they helped us, yes. Oh. Um, they, they let us use the footage from the candlelight march. Yeah. That's all. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan Schwerk? Yeah. Um, and particularly now, I, when Emily brought that up, what I am completely dismayed by now is the the hatred that is evidenced by people uh, against other people. It just kind of is like a blind, raging hatred. And with Richard's incredible performance this <sighs> evening in, the, in, the, in Dan White in the first act, what came, because I was in tears. And here's this murderer, yeah. this person full of hate, and it occurred to me that what happens is that good people become warped with hate. And, and somewhere in there, you, there's this person who has been good and honorable and honest, and this hate has completely warped them to do horrible, horrible things. And I don't know, how do you fight that? What do you do? Where do you start? I mean, in the South Pacific, you've got to be taught how to hate. How do we convince people not to do that, not to raise their children with hate? I, I mean, think that's a beautiful question. And I'm, <sighs> I think we're all grasp, grappling with that now because the, um, both, I, I think, the administration and the, and the virus has just shown a Klieg light on our society and, and we're now seeing things so clearly, all the fault lines, all the divisions, all the inequities. And I just, um, I was struck when we hear it was a divided city. We're a divided country mm -hmm. and the, it's on the same fault lines. They, we've never actually healed or come together. We just haven't done it. Mm -hmm. And now it's crystal clear again. It goes in cycles of, mm -hmm. I think, of being revealed. Someone, I think, was just... Yes, we have a few people. Ellen? Great. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm scrolling. Hey, I think it Haley that. is next. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Haley. Um, I was also thinking about like how I, when I was reading the script the other night, that I felt like I was sympathizing with Dan um, while I was reading it. And I was like, oh, maybe he isn't such a bad guy at first. And then obviously, um, you know, the act of playing it out makes it so much more as well. Um, and one of the lines that I had as a young mother is that the jury sees him as their son. So, so many people related to him and thought that he was such a good guy. Um, and I have a question is, how many other people were conflicted by it? Like, did you come across that in your- Yes, and I was so surprised. I did a reading of it early on of the rough draft. Um, and it was basically, uh, trial but all of these other characters were not in it and my good friend Chuck Me was there he said Emily you've written a reactionary play I went what <laughs> he said we're all crying for Dan White and then I realized I well it. yes well, yeah. because the people you heard from were not in the courtroom so I started the chorus of uncalled witnesses which is what you all were all of the people who were not heard from in court Moscone's friend, Milk's lover, um, the uh, the man at the prison with Dan White, all of, all of these were uncalled, they were not called, they were not there. Marianne White was too upset to go to court, but uh, I mean, sorry, Gina Moscone was too upset to go to court. Marianne White was there sobbing the whole time. Um, it was a, it, it was theater. But at the same, so I had to, I had to rebalance it. 
Um, but what I like about um, feeling that conflict is I think the only way we are going to see each other as human beings is if we don't, I was just judging him so badly I didn't have any sympathy for Dan White when I was writing it. And then it was once it was performed as beautifully as Richard, my pal, John Spencer did it and it, people were sobbing. So um, that to me is interesting. It's what theater is all about. You have to dig deep to find out as Paula said, oh my God, I felt for him, I cried and I was so angry. And that's, that's great that we have to all you know, struggle inside with all these conflicts inside of us and come out on the right side, you know, and reach out. We're not reaching out to each other. We're demonizing each other. That's we my- have, We have more folks. Yeah. Ellen? Yes, I think John Jay had a hand up. And then if we could hear from Juan Luis, it would be wonderful. Did we lose John Jay? Okay. Uh, if we could hear from Juan Luis, that would be really great. Juan Luis and then Eddie. Yes. Hi. Um, hi. Hi, it was such a pleasure to read. And Paula, thank you so much for the invitation. First, I, I wanna agree with what Ms. Emily Mann just said about reading this play and, and feeling like it's so current given the nature of the current administration right now. Um, just because I worked so hard, and I'm gonna say this very proudly for the other candidate to win, <laughs> I felt like my character at the end when it says, Harvey lit my spirit up. I felt like I needed that to be sitting at the Oval Office for this, this, this horrible experience we're going through right now with the virus but also with the killing of transgender people, of people of color, of incarcerating children. Ugh. I mean, I just, somebody was asking how good people turn bad, but I wonder sometimes also bad people can behave nicely. Yes, and so yes. <laughs> there is element this conversation to be had about how there's a lot of bad people and when did we decide that good is better than bad? In this performance, in this script and in this real life character, Mr. White is a complicated being. And I felt connected to him in many ways because of the way you're educated, the way you grow up, the way you're being pushed by society to get certain stuff done. And, and be able to accomplish certain stuff, that doesn't justify people killing people. Right. Saying, in my opinion, bad people can behave nicely every day to each one of us, and we know who they are. It, it, it's just, we don't want this to continue to happen. And, and I appreciate the, the writings of this play because first, it honors an amazing activist, and it always reminds us of what he said that's important, hope. We need to have hope and we need to work hard to change things. So thank you for allowing me to be part of it today. Oh, you've read so beautifully. Oh, you. my heart. Mm. Yeah. I think oh, there's folks. There you go, Eddie. We're gonna call you next, perfect. Okay, hey there. One who said that so beautifully. Um, there's a quote that you, uh, Emily, that you wrote for Harvey Milk. It says, uh, someone like me, a gay activist, becomes a target for a person who is insecure, terrified, afraid, or very disturbed themselves. Mm. I don't know that Dan and White is any different from Zimmerman, who killed Trayvon Martin. Right. Or any of the a number of people who have committed crimes against people simply because they are other. Mm -hmm. But as the, as the performance of Richard uh, Dan White was done tonight, it's important to understand that uh, so that you are 
to, to understand to understand them so that you can figure out well the process so that we can get past this. I think a lot of the disenfranchised or people who feel like Dan White or people who feel disenfranchised, I'm not saying they're disenfranchised, they feel disenfranchised or disconnected and feel other is why Trump got elected because yes. he felt ignored. And my anger with the other candidate was they, they dismissed that set of angry people. And as much as we may despise Dan White and hate what he did, we've got to figure out a way to better understand this population and figure out a way to communicate together so we can bring them closer to uh, humanity in terms of the way of treatment of others. Uh, so I think your balanced approach of, of showing as hard as it was and as painful as it was, um, it, the, the, the balance that you showed in, in portrayal of Dan is very important so that we don't demonize Dan. We understand him. We hate what he did. Yes. But yes. we need to look at the generations behind and say, how was Dan White created? Just as how was Zimmerman created? Zimmerman, I'm, had, I, I told them when they first started, I'm like, you're going to find Zimmerman has a mental problem. He does. And unfortunately, hopefully he did that he needs. Um, but how do we reach that population of people who don't have a way of, don't find a positive way of expressing their uh, dislike or anger or disconnection with other people simply because they are other than. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. agreed from all angles, the current administration is not helping that. <laughs> uh, but we can't ignore his constituency. We can't ignore him. We can't ignore the complicity of the senators uh, on his side. We, we do need to kind of figure out, well, how do we get through to some of these people to make them understand what's really at stake here um, because it could be the tables could be turned so that's all I had to say thank you thank you thank you I believe we saw Carol with the hand up if you'd like to share and Jason's on deck okay can you hear me yes all right yes so first of all, it was just such a, a, a moving experience and an honor to be a part of this. And Emily, I thank you and all. I especially thank you. And I also thank you for the saves, Paula. Um, and um, so, yes, oh, the, just the complexity of it all. And, and I was trying to have some understanding of, of Dan White through this, which I think you made happen um, really well. But one of the things that... Um, struck me kind of related to something, a conversation that I had recently, and it was the person who was giving the accolades to Dan White for his um, athletic prowess. Yeah. And that's, that's not a big area that I um, uh, want to see, you know, our children are just kind of thrown into so much athletics and, and it's made such a, a value and whatnot. And it's something that, of course, so often, um, um, uh, gay young people um, maybe feel a little bit of out of place in. And, and so I have such mixed feelings about that. But recently I had um, a, a person saying to me how their participation in sports really gave them the opportunity to um, be with people who didn't agree with them in other areas, and yet they could put that aside and, um, and come to a common goal. And that was kind of a metaphor to me of, of, of every place that we need to find common goals and, and, um, and somehow be able to put some of the differences um, that we feel aside and, and find that, you know, find the thing that uh, whatever is going to make us um, want to work together, to be together and stand together in things. And, um, and so that was um, just one place where, um, well, that something that struck me in this the other thing that struck me, I, and I'm just going to say this because I come from a Catholic background too, and um, being in that cathedral, and I tried to figure out 
what was going on for uh, Dan White um, in that setting, and and um, and really, ah, I, you you did such a marvelous job of of helping us um, feel some conflict about that character. So thank you, thank you, Maureen. Good, good, thank you. You know what? I, I, you're all being a whole lot kinder about him than I was. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, White, uh, 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 Harvey Milk's friend, says it so much. You know, so many of us who've been the victim of the All American Boy. You know, um, it's one of those gut level things for me, and I was the victim so often of it, and so. I, I had to work hard to, to understand the root of his, um, of his character. Mm -hmm. And it's important for a playwright, and I think especially a political playwright, to make things complex, as complex as real life. And um, in order to do that, I had to dig deep to find out where I could meet him and have the audience meet him, regardless of what side of the divide we're all on. And unfortunately, most of us don't bridge the divide mm -hmm. as much as I would like us to, or I'd like myself to. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you for both your comments, ladies. Uh, we're gonna go to Jason next, and then after that, we'll have Marshall on deck. Hello, um, thank you all for organizing. It was a pleasure to partake in and join in the uh, reading of this play, which uh, is wonderful. such a dramatic, uh, such a dramatic play. I, I'd like to ask Miss Mann, um, you explained the, what gave you the insight of the dramatic value of this issue was speaking with the cab driver. Um, and, and up until a few years ago, I, I never knew of, of Mr. Milk or of this situation. Uh, and then there was something in the reading where they referred to uh, Guyana and uh, Jim Jones and everything. Yeah. And, and I was thinking, did that, did that overshadow these events outside of California in the Bay Area uh, because of the mass, uh, you know, the mass suicide at that time? Like as a nation, were, was everyone looking at that and not uh, paying attention to this assassination? at that time? I okay. think that is so. I, it, it really did. Um, the front pages were just um, constantly dealing with um, the uh, Jonestown. Um, I happened to be living in a house of three floors and um, uh, a couple of the men in the house were gay activists and had worked with Harvey Milk and so I was um, lucky I was in Minneapolis at the time and um, they were destroyed by it and so I, I was with them a lot and I knew a lot about um, what had happened because of them but it was not it did not get the the, the press it should have gotten at that time yeah this is why you felt compelled to to uh, write it which is great yeah. yeah one of the reasons i have another play called greensboro requiem and that was mm -hmm. um uh, uh the uh murder of um uh an interracial group of activists um they were all murdered by the clan and the clan was acquitted um and um and that it had been pushed off the front pages because of um uh, the Iranian hostages had been taken. So I guess I am drawn to those stories also that haven't gotten enough attention. Um, and then of course it was wonderful that um, the mayor of Castro Street came out and also um, Rob and Richard's movie um, and this play that helped bring it um, to the forefront. And then I think who, who did, there was another sort of um, feature movie um, more recently that oh, yeah. featured. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have Marshall next and Anna will be on deck. Hi everybody, thank you for such a, a wonderful event tonight. It was, it was terrific and 
Emily, thank you for your 30 years sharing your talents with us in the Princeton community. Um, yeah. You know, you'll be, you'll be missed. Thank um, you. I, I, what stood out to me, this is a remarkable play, and I, I'm sorry to say I was not aware that it had been written, um, I, but it's, it's a, it's a, it, as I read through it and um, listened to everybody's ex extraordinary performance, by the way, I saw on in Broadway Wesley Snipes played Boom Boom. Is that right? That's right. That's ex what a performance. Before but, Wesley was famous, yeah, a lot of people yeah. are in there. Mary McDonald I gotta, I gotta say though, the the person who played Boom Boom tonight, I got has fabulous, terrific. I put yeah. I put that person up against anybody. But <laughs> what, what jumped out at me was the line Milk's friend said, "It was an effective assassination," and then. Later on, he says, they always are. I think what that brings out is the importance of remembering history and not getting too used to assassinations. We had so many school shootings before the pandemic. It was hard to keep track of them. We now have the Aubrey shooting. Yes. And yes. then the next line after that, after he says, they always are, the next person, Gwen, says, do they know about Stonewall? And, you know, it, it brings out the importance that it's, it's the memory that we have to keep alive. I certainly hope this play gets played, gets mounted uh, frequently. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're hoping to do uh, 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 a new production of it in New York whenever the theaters reopen. <laughs> we don't know when that will be. Yeah, you have to come. Anna, would you like to share? Yes, well, first of all, Ms. Mann, thank you so much for such a powerful and brilliant play, all of the event organizers for your prowess and for my fellow readers, just beautiful, beautiful performance. Um, what really struck me is one of my college readings in class was Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem about um, the trial of Adolf Eichmann for his Holocaust. Yes. Um, and one of the keys to Arendt's journalistic depiction of him is his a criminal that was thoughtless. And what we were talking about in class is that describing him as thoughtless discounts this feeling that we were talking about of having to wrestle with the fact that there can be thought and intent alongside hate. And that really plays into this mm -hmm. point for me about what is premeditated and what constitutes intent and where do you define that. And I think that Ms. Mann, as you said, it's that very struggle with the complexity of human nature and reconciling the awful, awful sides of humanity with the good ones that can help us wrestle and heal and process and ultimately move forward. Mm -hmm. so, Did you say that Eichmann was um, characterized as thoughtless? Thoughtless, yeah. It was a very interesting depiction. There were there were a lot of things about the the, the um, title was the banality of evil and just oh yes doing his duty. Yes, I have real problems with that. Yeah, yes. there, were, there were depictions of him as a clown, also just laughing yep. and not really understanding the um, the weight of his decisions. But I think I, I think that people are very capable of understanding the weight of their actions and doing them anyway. And I think that is the point. I agree with you wholeheartedly. You make my heart swell with happiness to hear you say that. I think he knew exactly what he's doing. I think so did Dan. And we can feel for him, yeah. but he knew what he was doing. Yeah. And Janet, you have something you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, well, echoing so much of what so many folks have said about the the tremendous pleasure of being able to to experience this this evening, and 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 all of these interrelated echoes that we're all talking about, and and so many of us are are focused on 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 uh, Dan White's speech in in particular um, that sort of climactic moment and and for me that was that moment that felt like like today because it it sort of laid bare for me this idea of people that that have this tremendous pain and anger because of this fear of loss of what they're losing mm -hmm. other people are finally starting to to gain what what they deserve and that there's somehow this idea that that it's a zero sum game situation, you know, and that we can't 
that we can't both rise. You know, that if, if that person is rising, that must mean that I have to fall. You know, it, yes. I sort of felt all of that in, in, in his, his speeches, you know, the way that, that, that you wrote them or crafted them from, from his actual, you know, testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, when I think about to our current situation, I, I feel like the, the hope in the current situation is that there are people that that base that are that are disenfranchised themselves or feel disenfranchised because they think they're going to lose and and the hope there is that those are folks that presumably there's a way to find the way to communicate with them if they're not motivated by by greed as some people higher up are motivated simply by greed uh, that that maybe there's some hope for people that are in are in pain and are on the other side, but maybe there is a way to reach them. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, that's not easily done. And I, you know, I don't think any of us have the answers to that. But I think that's why so many of us had these sort of feelings of empathy or something. For yeah. death, you know, because recognition too, I think, and frustration. I felt so frustrated, and I realizing. I spend so much of my days, I listen to the news and I'm so frustrated yes. and angry and because the right things are not being done. <laughs> you know, I, Gloria Steinem was someone I, I worked with a great deal and my last play was about her and, and um, she, she one time told me this great anecdote, um, which, which really helped me. She said she was, you know, she always takes the opportunity to talk to people whenever she can. And so she's talking to this guy he happened to be white and he um they were at a bar at a truck stop which she loves to do and he was he was complaining to her about you know what am i going to do you know this black guy got my job and she said well, what made it your job and that always stuck with me it was that sense of entitlement that this was this is supposed to be you know make america great again go back to how it was because that worked for me and it means other people were kept down. So I just find all of what's going on now is what I say that the Klieg light is blazing and I hope that we come out of this period of enforced reflection with um, ideas on how we have to change. Mm -hmm. That's my hope. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone else have something they'd like to say? We think we've exhausted. Oh, Susan, um, Susan Schwartz. Yeah, because and then Emily, Adele. Emily just brought up change. And when Eddie was talking, I had this thought that what I think what makes people fearful and then angry, because anger is often a cover up for fear, is change and uh, change, even change for the better, is difficult and people fight it because it's human nature to want to be where you've been and what you're used to. And I think the pandemic in that respect may be a wonderful opportunity because we're going to have to change gonna have to and change. it's going to have to happen and people are going to have to adjust to it and it may be a fabulous thing in that respect. It could be the golden lining or the silver lining to this incredible black cloud. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, it's just a thought. Adele? It's a great thought. I'm so sorry, Emily. I didn't mean to jump on you. Yeah. Adele and then Jarrell, please. Adele, can you unmute? Here we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. First off, a phenomenal play. And to be a part of it from the inside and hearing it, you know, and, and reading it. Um, it's, it's, it's almost the leitmotif of, of <laughs> failures of, in, in, of itself, all of the complexities by which we've been looking at the system of injustice in America. Um, and all the factors involved thereof. I mean, by even putting in the political aspects of something uh, in terms of if you favor someone's opinion, it becomes political. 
<laughs> and therefore it's it's a fight against the other idea. It's extraordinary. It, 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 you know, and uh, White's defense got me pissed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad I got them. someone I pissed. I heard this bullshit. I'm sorry. Um, I apologize for the youth here or whoever. <laughs> you know, we've just been hearing it and hearing. I mean, it's, it's, it's where's the, did you write the script, Emily? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it really, and how, why do we, ex why do we think that this, that it, it's okay for us to get into the psychology of his intent or whether he meant it as he's reloading because it's automatic or he feels, I mean, no, because we don't tolerate that. It was other people who are in that position, who have been put themselves in that position and killing people, how many bullets as a coroner, two people. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so violence is here. It's, it's America. And at the same time, Harvey said, it's working. Mm -hmm. System. The system works. works. Okay. And I went, whoa, whoa. I mean, prescient. I mean, and, and it works if we don't become puppets of those in power who wish us to be puppets to do their work. It's, it's important for us to think and to feel. Too bad White didn't have a chance to feel. Mm -hmm. He went to Ireland, he couldn't quite get his honeymoon going. You know, there was some, go I'm just putting it out there, all right? Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to allow for all of us to not be so conforming, that we all are individuals, you know, we have, we, we have things in common, much more common than, than not. And if you feel uncomfortable, be uncomfortable. I see what's happening going on here with um, my little perspective of the COVID-19 situation. I mean, people can't even deal with the reality that it, that it was coming, yeah? or that yeah. it's here, or that you can't get the haircut, nor the reality that all of the lines are relative to getting food, nor of the reality of that we're asking people, or people are saying, go back to work. We need health in the widest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, wonderful. It's story. wonderful that this play brings all this up. I yeah, love, and it's a my, marvelous play. And I wouldn't have been, gotten here had it not been for listening to all the phenomenal thought processes and articulations before me. Thank you. We are and we are of. just about at ten fourteen. So oh my, we've had you on for so long. Mm -hmm. I know that um, Jarrell. Um, would like to speak and I saw Keisha and Nancy and then I thought Lisa and Juan Luis again. So I think maybe oh we'll go with those four and then we'll wrap. Yeah, because you know, we, we do have a place where people can write. Oh, yeah, thank you. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. But so let's, let's hear from the last people and then we'll give out those, um, um, that information. Well, yes. Jarrell, please, sir. Jarrell. Awesome. So, uh, Hey, everybody, and uh, thank you for having this event. I'm really, really glad now. I, I thought I was going to be the first person that said that I had a different kind of reaction. So I'm really glad Adele went right before me because <laughs> uh, I, 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 it, it was a very similar feeling. So it's really well written, right? It has this really great movement to it. And I wonder is, if this has ever been done as like a dance piece. There's, huh? such, there's such a great... The, the language, the way that the language works in that scene is great, but like, so like when he's talking, all I can think about is like my grandfather to the fifth degree was a slave. You know what I mean? Like that's, so I don't, I don't have sympathy for him because all I can see is the hypocrisy of the system. However, because it's so well written, the hypocrisy of the system works both ways. The, like everything that needs to be there in order for him to walk is already there. Yes. The system has already been in place. And so right. to that, what you're watching is just, it's, it's like when people get upset about uh, something that happened that, that the Supreme Court justice, sorry, that a court, uh, when a court ruling comes out and people say that the system's not working, 
And the answer is the system is working. It just wasn't meant to work for fairness when it comes to black people or when it comes to poor people. So the way that the script is written, it's that's so clear and there's such a great movement to it that my, my anger, w <laughs> the script was so compelling that it overshot my anger for the fact that I was watching a white guy get off because he was essentially the perfect white guy. If right. I no, it total makes sense. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Oh, that was so well articulated. Thank you. Keisha and Nancy, you put your hand down. Did you have something to say? Hi, um, it's Keisha. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to this. This was wonderful. Um, I just was going to say a while back, a, a lot of people have made the same point, but I didn't feel... Uh, sympathy for him when he was uh, during his confession I thought it was um and the the actor that did it was wonderful because it was so nuanced but um all I heard was entitlement and I think mm. you mentioned that and just you know a self-pity mm -hmm. and this sort of default view that well, I'm, you know, I'm this hardworking regular guy and this shouldn't be happening to me. I mean, he's just mm -hmm. people. Right, lack of agency. Yes, and, and also I, all I thought of was Brett Kavanaugh. Me too, <laughs> me too. This right? is the first time I put it together that Dan White and Brett Kavanaugh are like identical. <laughs> oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. so the, I just was gonna say, you know, that, that um, I was getting angrier and angrier, you know. Um, but he was compelling. The way he read it was great. The way it's written is, is there's a humanity to it, ultimately, of course. But, um, you know, I just felt, you know, it's the, the whole kangaroo court thing. That, that's what, you know, that everything is, as the gentleman said, that everything was already in place for him to win. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, the, and the kind of, we won't get fooled again. Like, we've heard this bullshit over, you know what I mean? In terms of, you know, the sympathy, like you, you spend time and it's that, isn't that always the case where a lot of the time gets spent on the white guy who create, committed the crime and everyone's so interested in him psychologically, right. whereas yeah. the victims are always, you know. Totally. And then the liberals sit back and go, but it was an open and shut case. How could this happen? You know, but didn't work hard enough. Right. The prosecution did not work hard enough. Right, and I yeah. love the juxtaposition of all the different voices. Oh yeah, that was amazing. Oh good, good. Um, Juan Luis and Lisa Patterson, did you want to speak again as a end? Maybe not. Juan I Luis, just, it's you. Hi, I just wanted to go back to something Emily said about having to get to know this character and it was about bullying and the abuse and I think that the bullies do what they do because they are letting them do it and and we can fight them and we have to fight them and continue to fight in the in the I was watching a movie and that's why I'm bringing it up because the the writer of the novel that's being interviewed they ask him why is your character why don't we we don't know more about your character. Will, will we ever know why he murders people? And he said, why? But why does he do it? Because he can. And I think that bullies are the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to continue this fight. And a play like this covers so much of what's going on right now that I am excited for the prospect of it coming back. So congratulations to everyone again. Thank you, Paula. Thank you honestly. Thank you. Yes. I just want, uh, do we have anyone else or is that the, our I, last person? I think Lisa's it and then um, we have just uh, a wrap up by Rob. Yes and I wanted to thank Rob so much for this. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Go ahead Lisa. All I wanted to say was Emily it's really interesting because you you yourself mentioned a couple of your other plays and I you know had never uh, seen or heard this play before, although I'd seen and heard many of your other plays, and just the whole body of work and how, how it comes together and how when you talk about history being cyclical, and I remember 
uh, watching Gloria and watching the news footage of the uh, parents and children being separated at the border uh, yeah. 50 years ago or 40 years ago. And I, I just started crying when I saw that because here it is, it's in the headlines now. And have we not learned anything? Uh, and, you know, so Emily, your work has been so important socially and there's so much more work to do. And I say, we've been so lucky to have you here in Princeton and I can't wait to see what you're gonna do next. Thank you, Lisa, that means so much to me. Rob, throwing it to you, sir. Thank well, you, that, Emily. That's, that's a lot thank to you. after. Mm -hmm. Emily, thank you so much. It's such an honor to just share the virtual stage with you again especially after hearing this show and seeing this show. And, you know, God, I think this, you know, we had originally planned this, for those of you who don't know, as a production to go on the stage at McCarter. And I, I dare say this was more potent and more powerful this way. I agree. <laughs> I thought it was just incredible because to be so close to everyone and then have this intimate community discussion, I agree with you, Rob. So I was supposed to come on now and, and plug our virtual pride, which is taking the place of our pride parade this year. And instead of doing a pride parade in Princeton, which obviously we cannot, um, we're doing a virtual pride, which will be a national uh, gathering together on June 20th, evening of June 20th. I'm not gonna do that now. You can find that on our Facebook page. If you're interested, I hope you will be. I hope you'll join us and march together virtually in celebration and solidarity. What I do want to say, and even if I didn't run this show, and even if I didn't run the Social Justice Power Hour, we have these kind of conversations every night. Every weeknight for the past 11 weeks, we've had these conversations, whether it's with Amani Gandhi, who is a reporter for Rewire News, talking about how women's reproductive rights and reproductive justice is being taken away from us during COVID because they can. Um, whether it was Dr. Peniel Joseph, who was on just the other night for the second time, talking about his book, The Sword and the Shield, which is about the false dichotomy that we've been served up in history about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. um, and whether it's Monday night, this coming up Monday night, which I implore you all to join us, where we're going to have April Rain, who I said before, was the person that coined the term Oscars so white. And that's not just a hashtag, that's about what's really aberrant in our society, that we don't see the privilege. And this is what this play talked all about. Um, so I hope that you'll all join us. Virtual pride is one thing, and we're really proud of what that's going to be. But this power hour, which this was a part of, which we're so proud it was, um, every weeknight we have these conversations, community building, camaraderie, virtual fellowship and I implore you all to, to come and be a part of that conversation. Emily, you too, please. Uh, Thank your you. Place would be so welcome. Um, we've had an incredibly diverse group of folks and this was an incredibly diverse of folks. I, I said it at the outset and I want to reiterate it to end the evening. The, the incredible spectrum that I could see in the gallery was my favorite mm -hmm. part of this night seeing all these faces from across the spectrum of gender, identity, race, race as ethnicity, sex or a lack thereof, binary, non-binary, whatever it was, all these identities, all these folks, all these faces, all these incredibly beautiful members of our diverse communities. Thank you for bringing this together. Paula, Emily, and every single one of you that came out tonight, whether you read, whether you watched, whether you witnessed, it's all important for us becoming a community and we love you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. We so appreciate you and Carol at the center and all the folks who by their affiliation through the Bayard Rustin Center for Social Justice joined us tonight. I'm grateful for the staff support from McCarter, for Cheryl Mintz, our amazing stage direction reader and stage manager to Perry Jones, who was helping us, like is the basis of our tech, to Andrew Cuevas, who is with us in the Facebook room, and my dear um, friend, Ellen, we so appreciate you. 
My final line is thank you again for joining us today. And if you're looking for more virtual offerings from one of New Jersey's professional theaters, please visit www.njtheateralliance.org slash stages hyphen online. And of course, we've already been asked, how do we learn more about events like these? And I believe Andrea jumped, dumped it into the chat, but you can go to McCarter's webpage um, and look at all of our McCarter at Home offerings and also sign up so that you'll receive um, uh, announcements every Monday. We're announcing our new opportunities. I was gonna say, let's hang out for fellowship, but I'm exhausted. <laughs> so instead, I'm gonna give Emily the last word and thank you all again from the bottom of my heart for your participation tonight. It was really um, a delight. Thank you. Emily, it's all you. And you're on mute. She can't mute. unmute. There you go. Oh, I'm, oh, good. Well, I just want to thank everyone again. Um, I cannot imagine a more wonderful way to um, experience this play again in my life than with all of you in um, fellowship tonight. It's beautiful. For those of you who didn't get a chance to speak at the talking circle, but would like to share your experience we invite you to um, write your experience down and post it in Facebook comments or email it to askus at mccarter.org. And may I again thank all of you who made it happen, Paula and Rob and the Bird Rustin Center, you doing phenomenal work and we all need each other to get through these very difficult times. And I hope we continue the conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay well. Bless. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you, Emily. You. So much. Bye. Bye. Good night, Bye. Good night all. Bye.